she did. <laughs> okay. Uh, bef before we get in, uh, bring in the jury, is there anything we need to be aware of before we call back our witness from the state? Um, no, Your Honor. I just would. Um, I know yesterday the state moved to admit by stipulation exhibits one through twelve, and I right. just want to make sure that they were in fact admitted. Yeah, they, they've been admitted. Ms. Morning, any, anything else before we call back the witness? No, Your Honor. Thank you. And I forgot something in my office. Let me get it real quick, and I'll be right back. And then, <coughs> so give me a second, Loretta. We'll call in the jury. All rise. State, have your witness come back to the witness stand? Yes, sir. And then we'll call in the jury. Or they can bring in the jury. Bring in? Yes. Hey, Mr. Walker, come back to the witness stand. Just come back over here. Good morning, you may be seated. Okay, Ms. Morrissey, you may continue. Good morning, Mr. Walker. Good morning, ma'am. 
<clears throat> I'm going to play you a portion of the audio recording that was played in court yesterday. So it's the, it's the five minute portion of uh, your audio recording. Okay, I'm not going to play the whole five minutes. Uh, I'm going to start it for counsel at one minute, five seconds. Let's see if I've got my volume right. Bear with me here for technical issues. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> we understand that, sir. We have to follow our policies and procedures, okay? Devastated is. Right. Did you hear him say I'm devastated? Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, after we broke for the day yesterday, did you have an opportunity to review the entire audio recording? Yes, ma'am. So yesterday you testified that you left your recording device in your patrol unit when you went to clear the residence. Now that you've had an opportunity to listen to the whole recording, is that correct? Yes, there was a portion where I took it out of my pocket for I was having a discussion with Deputy Honey Estiwa, and I later made the decision to return it back to my person. Well, l l let, me, l let me make sure that you're understanding my question. What you testified to yesterday was that you did not take your recording device with you when you cleared the residence. You left it in the unit, right? No, that is a mistake that I made. Okay. That is what you said yesterday, but that was not correct. That is correct. Okay. So you didn't leave your recording device in the unit with Mr. Cummings. You took it in with you when you cleared the residence, right? That is correct. Okay, because we can hear you talking about what you're seeing as you're clearing the residence, correct? That is correct. Yes, All right. Having listened to the entire audio recording, at any point in time, do you ask Mr. Cummings his name? No, ma'am. So at no point in time did he refuse to give you his name? To my knowledge, that is correct. Okay. And you wrote a police report related to this incident, correct? Yes, ma'am. And nowhere in your police report do you make any mention of him refusing to give you his name. Is that correct? That is correct. And. Not that the law required you to do this at this point in time, but just as a point of clarification, you never Mirandized Mr. Cummings. Is that right? That is right. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. <coughs> Ms. Rommel. Mr. Hayden, just, just to clarify, um, what I believe I asked you yesterday was, were you aware of whether attempts had been made to um, obtain the defendant's identity? Do you recall me asking you that question? I do recall. Objection, I would ask to approach. <laughs> okay.
So your testimony is, is that you never asked the defendant his identity, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And if you had asked him his identity, you would have put that in your police report, right? Yes, ma'am. Now, what is the purpose of, of a police report? And why do you do a police report? So that way I can recall the events if I'm ever needed to testify to them. Okay. And I know you're not in law enforcement anymore, but um, after the event of t t uh, February 29th of 2020, did you go on other calls? Yes, ma'am. Um, how many calls approximately do you think you went on? Thousands. Thousands. Okay. Um, and you haven't been with the agency you testified yesterday since when? July. Of this, year, of this past yes, year? Okay. Um, so you were also asked a question about whether you, in fact, asked Mr. Cummings about whether or not he wanted medical attention and he did not reply. Do you recall being asked that question by Ms. Morrissey? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And is that something that if you had, would that have been noted in your report? Yes, ma'am. And is that, is that in your report? To my knowledge, yes, ma'am. Would you like to see the report to refresh your memory? Yes, ma'am. May I approach? Mm -hmm. That is in my report. And did you, um, again, why, why was it that you asked him if he needed medical attention? <clears throat> I believe he told me that he was attacked. Okay. And I always think that it's a good practice to ask anybody if they need an ambulance. And did you personally observe any signs that he had been attacked in any way? No, ma'am. Describe so we can have a better idea. There was a lot of uh, discussion between you and Ms. Morrissey yesterday back and forth about dispatch and your, uh, I guess your uh, response, not responses, but your ability to hear dispatch and what was being told. Can you give us an idea of how the, the radio reception was out there? Um, the topography, I guess you could say the geography out there, you're going through valleys and canyons. So just depending on where you're at, you might have radio reception, you might not. It just, I mean, you could have it for 10 feet and then not have it for 10 feet. So it just, it's very patchy out there. Okay. So before you went to the scene, did you know the identity of Mr. Cummings? No, ma'am. Okay, and when you, went, when you got to the scene and made contact with Mr. Cummings, were there other deputies around you? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us approximately how many and who they were? Uh, two deputies during the initial response. That would be Deputy Honey Estiva and Sergeant Crispine. Okay. And after we broke yesterday, um, there was a lot of discussion about the entire belt tip. Okay, let me, let me ask you, the, the five-minute segment that, that we played yesterday, does that incorporate the entire interaction you had with Mr. Cummings? No. Okay. What other interaction was there on the entire belt tape? So there was some discussion while I was talking to Deputy Honey Estiva. You can hear Mr. Cummings making comments. Um, it's very difficult to make out what he was saying, but... Um, there was, he was talking to us okay. that there's taken out of the five minute section. And you did listen to the entire? Yes, ma'am. And did you, uh, did you, um, did you review the entire tape for accuracy? Yes. Your Honor, I would like to admit States Exhibit 14. I'm not going to play it, but that way if the jury has any questions, so there's no inference that we're trying to hide anything. Well, from an evidentiary standpoint, you can't because it's full of inadmissible hearsay. Uh, so I understand what Ms. Romo is trying to do, but it is full of hearsay from this, uh, for, from this gentleman, from the other deputies that were on scene. If they're going to testify, they need to come into the courtroom and testify. testify. They can't testify through that audio recording. 
Your Honor, she opened the door by making an, an, uh, an inference to the jury that the state was trying to hide something by not playing the well, entire. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to allow it. I'm sorry, Judge, I I'm couldn't hear you. I'm not going to allow okay, it. Okay, thank you. I just couldn't hear you. <clears throat> Mr. Walker, you did enter the entire unredacted video for evidence, did you not? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Pass the words. I know. May this witness be permanently excused? Ms. Romo. Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that I would want to call him back, but I'm going to reserve him. He certainly doesn't need to stay in Sandoval County. Okay. Officer, uh, you're excused. You may be subject to recall, but uh, if, if they call you, they call you back home, okay? Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Cool. State, you may call your next witness. Is this with Jonathan? State calls Jonathan Crestine. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Witness, we can call you. Yeah, yeah, why don't you call your other witness? Then? We'll call Christine Landers. Okay. Good morning, Ms. Landers. Can morning. you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, we, because we have these masks on, it's a little hard to hear. 
So if you could try to speak up as, as clearly as you can into the microphone so everyone can hear your testimony, all right? Okay. Can you start by spelling your first and last name? Christine, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, Landers, L-A-N-D-E-R-S. Ms. Landers, are you a little bit nervous today? Just a smidgen. Just a smidgen. <laughs> okay, we'll try to relax. I think there's some water there for you if you need it, and um, we'll try to, try to make it as gentle as possible, okay? Um, Ms. Landers, do you, did you know someone named Guillermo Ariola? Yes, I did. And how did you know him? I'd actually known him for 20 years. I moved here from uh, New Hampshire, and um, I had a couple of horses, and he was highly recommended. So I'd been here just a couple of years when I uh, contacted Placidas Yard Works, which was Guillermo. That was his business? Yes. And, and what, what kind of business was that? What did you hire him for? Uh, yard work, uh, weeds, um, he had a, um, he had a bobcat, he would remove my manure for me, he built things for me, and of course my husband, I don't want you to think it was just for me, but yeah, he built a lot, and he, he was very good at what he did, and very honest, and he showed up always on time. Okay, um, without, for what? What's the objection? Approach the bench. Okay, Ms. Landers, you, you said that you hired him to do some work. You said bobcat. Now, you're not talking about the animal. You're talking about the machine, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and did you already say you knew him how long? 20 years. 20 years. Okay. Um, and did, do you, what is your occupation? I'm a real estate agent. Okay. And did you ever have any occasion to... Um, have real estate dealings with Mr. Guillermo? Yes, I, I mean, did. I Mr. Ariola? Yes. Okay. And um, specifically, did you have occasion to draw up a contract for some land purchase between Mr. Ariola and the defendant, Mr. Cummings? I drew it up, yes. Okay. And before we go further, let me see if I can just, I think... Are we on Exhibit 14, I believe? 14? Yes. 14. Sure. She's not my witness, so. Oh, she's Ms. Moss's witness. May I approach? You may. That's Guillermo. That's Mr. Ariola? Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. This is for Okay. Is it 15? Okay. How do we 15. make it 15? All right. So, and you, when you, what, what was your, okay, first of all, did you, how long, or did you have occasion to meet the defendant, Mr. Cummings? Once. Okay. And what was, without saying anything that was said, what was the occasion of that meeting? What was the purpose of the meeting? To go over the contract. Okay. 
And was the contract signed? No, it was not. Okay. And do you know why? He wanted to take it to an attorney to look at it. But it was never signed? It was never signed. We did not have an executed contract. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to observe the interaction between Mr. Cummings and uh, Guillermo? Yes. Okay. And, and how would you describe their interaction? How did they get along? I thought they got along fine. Um, did you ever see them arguing? No, I did not. Um, did you know uh, Mr. Guillermo to carry mace? Not that I'm aware of, but I was told. I'm sorry, I, I say Mr. Guillermo, I mean Mr. I, I know, know, it's okay. Um, um, uh, you never saw him carry I mace. never saw it, he never showed it to me. Okay. Um, did you ever see Mr. Ariola with any sort of weapons like firearms? Never. And were you made aware of the purpose or why Mr. Um, Cummings was, excuse me, why Mr. Ariola was going to his property on the 29th of February. Yes. And 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 as a was that because you were his real estate agent? Yes, I had talked to him. Okay. The Friday before. And was it your understanding that he was going out there to try to finalize the purchase? No. I'm going to object to your side. Can I rephrase? Rephrase. Was it your understanding as the, I mean, as your, as a real estate you would, agent, you would have to know the status of the real estate contract, correct? Correct. Okay. And when Mr. Uh, Adiola went out to the property, what was the status of the, the contract negotiations to your knowledge? There was none. Okay. And, and why is that? Because there was no signed contract. What was, um, how big was the property that Mr. Adiola was, was attempting to sell to the defendant? Oh. Do you know? If you saw the contract, would that refresh your memory? Yes. Okay. Now, these are not... Let me mark these. Your memory. Okay. I want to show you the document that identifies identification for purposes of page 16. Yes. Can you take a look at that and tell me if you recognize it? I know it's on some different kind of funny paper. Yeah, it's okay. But yes, I recognize it. Um, and is that the contract that you drew up? Yes. Okay. What was the purchase price supposed to be? 149. Okay. And were there any terms of payment? Yes. Okay. It was $5,000 down uh, with a balance of 144 and he was to pay uh, $1,200 a month okay. to be there. And as, as part of that contract, um, was, there, was there any arrangement as part of the contract for the defendant to be allowed to to live in the, the residence that was on the property? Uh, no, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. He had a fifth wheel and Mr. Ariola had poured a pad for, for him to be there. Okay. And I don't see on, the hold on. acreage. Hold, hold on. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. She's going to just say don't something. See I don't see the acreage on here. It was quite a big piece yeah, of it was. Correct? Yes. Okay. 
And in your opinion, how did the defendant, or how did Mr. Ayala treat the defendant? Very well. He liked him. Okay. Did, did you, were you aware of any kind of gift that he gave him? A horse. He gave him a horse? Do you know if Mr. Adiola had any physical disabilities? Just his back. He had a back brace on when he worked. Okay. And you said you've known him for almost 20 years? Yeah. When did you when did you find out that Mr. Adiola had passed away? Sunday morning. Okay, and the day after. How did you find out? Who told you? His sister. So were you friends with the family? Yes, I was. Is Mr. Cummings in the courtroom today? I think so. Can you um, point him out or describe a piece of clothing that he's wearing? He's wearing a blue mask and he's sitting behind the computer. What color is his tie? Say it again. Can you tell what color his tie is? No, I can't see it. The computer's in the way. It looks blue. Good. Okay. Did the, the record reflect that the witnesses identified the defendant? And for the record, we'll stipulate that this is Mr. Cummings. All right. Okay. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Good morning, Ms. Landers. Good morning. Now, you just testified that you drafted up a real estate contract at the request of Mr. Ariola. Is that correct? That is correct. And you drafted up that contract working as Mr. Ariola's agent in correct. this transaction. Correct. Please let me finish my questions, okay? I'm sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> so you were working as the seller's agent and not a buyer's agent? Yes. Okay. Was there a buyer's agent involved in this transaction to represent Mr. Cummings? No. When Mr. Cummings came, to your, came in to review the contract, he reviewed it line by line, didn't he? He took some time with it, yes. Well, the time he took to review that contract, it annoyed you, didn't it? No, it did not. Do you remember an interview that you had with me and my investigator? Yes, I do. Okay. And do you remember during that interview, if we talked about that meeting with Mr. Cummings? Yes. And do you remember talking about how long it took for him to review that contract? It took him about 45 minutes, so yes. And the amount of time it took for him to review that contract, it annoyed you, didn't it? Ashton answered, Your Honor. No, it did not annoy me. Do you remember providing a written statement to a detective in this case? Yes. And do you remember in that written statement? Hold on a second, let me try to find it. Do you remember in that written statement that you provided to the detective saying, Cummings came in and provided, proceeded to read the purchase agreement line by line, I was annoyed. Well, it was two years ago, so I'm not annoyed now, but I don't think I was annoyed. I think I was wondering where we were going with this. Do you remember the writing in your statement to the detective that you were annoyed by Mr. Cummings? Okay, yes. Okay. 
And Mr. Cummings actually wanted to take that contract to his own attorney before signing it, didn't he? Yes, he did. And you refused to let him do that? We didn't have a signed contract, and I did not know Mr. Cummings. And so I offered to go with him to the attorney office. I would sit outside. But because I work for the commission also, I don't give my contracts just and let them go. Okay, so your answer to that was no, you would no. not let him take the contract Correct. and review it with his own attorney, would you? Correct. Okay. And would you agree that he was good to Guillermo when you saw the two of them together? I don't have an opinion about that. You, I know that Guillermo liked him. And do you recall during our interview back in February of this year when you told me that Mr. Cummings was good to Guillermo? Okay, yes. Can we approach? Thank Sorry. you. Okay, and before uh, Ms. Romo objected, I had asked you, isn't it true that Mr. Cummings treated Guillermo well? At the time I saw them together, yes. Okay, and would you agree that Mr. Cummings uh, was standoffish with you? Yes. And did you feel that he didn't trust you? No. No? Okay. Do you recall telling me during our interview that you thought that Mr. Cummings didn't trust you? I don't recall that interview, but okay. okay. Now you talked a little bit about the fact that you have known Mr. Ariola for 20 years. Correct. Um, and it sounds like he did a fair amount of work for you? Yes, he did. Did the two of you ever socialize together? No. Okay, did you ever go out to dinner together? No. Did you ever have cocktails with him? No. Did you ever see Mr. Ariola when he was intoxicated? No. Did you ever know him to drink alcohol? No. Okay. Did you ever know him to use illicit drugs? No. Did you ever see him when you thought he was on drugs? No. Thank you. I passed the witness. Landers, prior to your um, your involvement as a real estate agent in trying to negotiate this contract, this real estate contract with the defendant, did you know the defendant at all? No, I did not. And you you were um, asked a question about your written statement, and I know it's been a long time since you wrote it. Have you had a recent opportunity to review it? No, I have not. Um, 
when when she when the defense counsel asked you about the fact that you said you were annoyed um, what did when you in that statement you also said that Guillermo told you something about that as well right would you like to see the statement to refresh your memory Thank you. yes please may I approach Yes, it does. You said he would have done the same thing to read it line by line. Okay. And you're talking about the interaction. Did you indicate any, she was asking you about your feelings or the feelings that Mr. Cummings and Mr. Guillermo had towards each other? Now you don't, did you have any long conversations with the defendant, Mr. Cummings? No. Okay. Um, and she asked you, I believe, if, if you felt that the defendant didn't trust you. Do you remember her asking you that? I, I remember her asking me that. I was very emotional when I was talking to her. Did you ever um, express any feelings to, the defend, to Mr. Ariola about the defendant? Yes. And what did you say? That... Hold on, counsel, put the band. Just based on your own observations, what, what did you feel about the defendant in regards to this whole transaction? I felt that he was, I felt he was taking advantage of Mr. Ariola because he didn't pay anything to be there and Mr. Ariola was doing everything he could to get I'm the contract. Well, how am I supposed to answer it? Sorry. You, you made an observation that you recorded in your statement. And what was that? You felt what? I'm going to object to leaving now. Well. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll allow a certain amount of leaving. Do, would you like to look at the statement again? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Um, he was, um, he showed up late. Well, just, just what were you, what was your observation that you My observation the was that he was not, uh, oh God, how do I say it? Um, Did you indicate that there was something strange and something was not quite right? Correct. Okay. I did. Thank you. Pass the witness. Okay. 
Uh, is there any reason why we need to uh, possibly recall this witness from the state? Ms. Romo, can we, can we, we permanently let her go? Yeah, we should reserve her for rebuttal, Your Honor. Okay. Any objection to permanently letting this witness go? No, just, and Your Honor, we would ask to reserve her. Okay. I'm, I'm going to let you go, but they may call you back some, in the next few days, okay? Thank you. They, they would call you if they call you back. Thank you. Okay. Yes. And be careful with you. Judge, can, can we approach real quick? Go, go ahead and step down. Everyone. Don't discuss your testimony with anyone. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Be careful. All right. Okay. Stay. Let me call your next witness. State calls Jonathan Christine. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Could you please spell and, well, say and spell your first and last name? Sure. My first name is Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N. My last name is Crespin, C-R-E-S-P-I-N. So I've been pronouncing it wrong. It's Crespin. It, it depends where you're at. Northern New Mexico, Southern New Mexico, some people roll the R. <laughs> well, I will pronounce it the way you pronounce it, sir. So, Mr. Crespin, where are you employed? I'm currently employed with Sandoval County Sheriff's Office. And what are your duties with Sandoval County Sheriff's Office? My duties are to manage uh, the patrol division. Okay. How long have you been with the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office? I've been with San Miguel, or, uh, Sandoval County for since 2018, October. Okay. I think you might have hinted at the next question, but do you have previous law enforcement experience? Yes, I was a former sergeant in uh, San Miguel County, which is uh, Las Vegas area, New Mexico area. Okay. Were you with the sheriff's office there too? With the sheriff's office, correct. And any law enforcement before that? No. Okay. Um, so how many years total with law enforcement? It'll be eight, uh, over seven and a half years. Okay. And um, what sort of training have you had? That's a long question. <laughs> Training as far as uh, just similar to homicides or to... Well, and you, you went to the basic academy. Correct? Yes. Okay. Well, schooling, so I do have a degree in criminal justice. I do have my, ba my uh, basic uh, academy. Uh, obviously, I went to the academy my police certificate. Um, I do have a lot of advanced certificates after that as well. Okay. Too many to count. Do you have any spe uh, special training in... Um processing of scenes, scene processing, anything like that? I do. Okay. And what about um, in terms of homicide investigation? I do. You do. Can you yeah. tell us about that a little bit? So I do have uh, training in uh, managing homicide scenes. Um, I also have experience. I've worked um, homicides before. I've worked on a cold case, uh, missing persons that turned out to be suspicious. I have a lot of uh, experience when it comes to things like that. Let me direct your attention back to February 29th of 2020. Were, were you on duty that day? Yes, I was. And what, what was your, were you a, a patrol sergeant at that time as well? That's correct. Okay. 
And on that day, did you receive a call out to go to a location somewhere um, near Cabazon Peak? Yes, I did. Can you tell us, well, tell the jury, first of all, about what time did that call come in to you? So I was en route to that call. It was around 540 is when I was en route that way when the call came out. And what was the nature of the call? So the nature of the call, the call came out as a uh, possible shooting uh, near this area. And where were, where were you directed to, to go? Um, to coordinates. There are some coordinates provided, um, so I was directed to go to those coordinates. You said coordinates? Coordinates, correct. Okay. So there were no streets or, or highways or anything to direct you? No, it's very rural. The area, um, it was nothing but desert. One house in the middle of nowhere that, that I observed. Okay. And, and where, where were you, I'm sorry if you already said, but where were you when you actually received the call? Were you at the office? No, I believe I was uh, on patrol in somewhere in Bernalillo near uh, 550 and 528, the major highways. And did you, ha did you receive any instructions of any, anyone to uh, meet up with when you went out? Do you know? To, uh, with nobody else but the calling party. Okay. We were to meet with the calling party. Okay. And, and were you given directions of where the, the calling party would be? That's where the... I believe the coordinates were where the calling party was at. Okay. So when you went out there, um, were you in a marked unit? Yes, I was in a marked unit. And you were wearing the uniform with your badge of office? Yes, full uniform, displaying my badge of office, correct. Okay. So at some point, did you meet up with the calling party? Yes, I did. Can you tell the jury approximately how long it took you to from the time that you left Bernalillo to meet up with the calling party? I believe it was uh, at 626 is what I documented in my report okay. when I arrived on scene with the calling party. Okay, and how did you go out there? Did you go out there at normal speed or, or did you go out there? Uh, it, it was quote, uh, lights and sirens. Okay, okay. Um, so when you got there, who did you meet up with? Uh, the first person I met with was the calling party and two of my deputies. Okay. And from that point, what did you do? From there, we were trying to figure out what was going on, basic who, what, when, where, why, what happened. Um, once we determined that a male subject was possibly shot, um, our main goal was to get to the property, see if we can um, conduct any life-saving measures. So we proceeded to the property with the calling party. Okay. So did the calling party lead you guys out there? Yes. Okay. And from from where you, you were from where you met up with the, the calling party, um, how how far was it from where you met up with him to when you actually reached the residence? It, it was miles. Um, I documented four miles was my estimate. Um, the reason being is he had to go to a place where he got cell phone service, and it was about four miles away from the property. So when, when, you, when you got to the place um, where you met up with the calling party, was there cell phone service at that point? Yes. Okay. At, at that designated location where he was originally at, yes. Okay. And, and how was the cell phone service? Uh, I had like one bar. I was lucky if I had my phone up in the air, but it did, it did make phone calls from that location. So it was, it was spotty? It was what? Spotty, would you say? No, no. Reliable? It, 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 or? it was reliable. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so now when you were driving out there, can you describe what, what kind of roads were they? Were they paved? No, dirt road. Nothing but dirt road. Okay. Um, and, and were they maintained at all? Uh, I mean, they were drivable, so somebody had to be out there. But, yeah, they, they weren't that bad. Okay. I don't know if they were maintained. Okay. So do you know approximately how long it would have taken you from the time that you met up with the calling party to get to the actual residence where the incident took place? Uh, it was about a five to ten minute time frame. Okay. Okay. Um, when, okay, so when you got to the residence, well, first of all, when you were driving out there, was it already, was it dark or was it still light? It was light. It was still light? Yes. And when did it get dark, do you recall? I mean, during the whole process, when did it get dark? It got dark close to 10 o'clock at night, between 9 and 10 p.m. Okay. 
So when you when you drove out there to the scene, um, what what did you what's the first thing that you you encountered? So when we got on scene, the first thing we encountered um, was um, Dean. He was leaving the property as we were um, setting up a, peri a perimeter. So the when first thing we encountered was Dean. When you say Dean, do you mean Dean Cummings, the defendant? Yes, yes, Dean Cummings. And do you see him here in the courtroom? Ah, uh, I don't. I don't remember. No, I don't see him. You don't remember what don't, he looks like? No. Okay. Um, how do you know that it was Dean that you encountered? Uh, by his name, him identifying himself as his first name as Dean. Okay. Um, do you recall writing a report? Yes. Do you recall in that report where you indicated that he did not, he refused to give you his identity? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. So when did he give you the name? Uh, uh, initial contact when I first met with him, when the deputies were um, doing a protective sweep of the property to make sure it was safe. I was trying to identify Dean. And did he identify himself initially? By his first name, Dean, yes. Did he, did he refuse to give you any other information? Uh, he was, he, I, I couldn't identify his name and his full name and date of birth, which I needed for our records. Um, so that he failed to do. Okay. Um, okay, so when you say you encountered him, how did you encounter him? What was he doing? He was leaving the property in a vehicle. I believe it was a pickup truck. Uh, right away, we gave him commands to place him in investigative detention, make sure the, the scene is safe. Um, he was compliant, got out of the truck, showed us his hands. Only thing I could hear him yelling was self-defense, self-defense. Um, we did place him in handcuffs, double locked them, check for proper fit, and placed him in, one of the deputies placed him in the back of a patrol unit, a marked patrol unit that was on scene. So did you ask him any questions? I did not ask him any other questions be try besides trying to identify him. And why is that? Because he, he, he was placed in investigative detention for a pretty serious allegation of, of murder. So our protocol and policy and procedures if, is to identify this individual. To wait for the detectives? To identify him? No, I did not. Okay, did, okay so, so let me ask you, you said he was, without being asked, he was yelling self-defense, self-defense. Did he make any other spontaneous statements to you? Not that I recall. Okay. Did you have a chance to observe um, the defendant, Mr. Cummings? I did, yes. Okay. And um, did you observe any visible signs of injury on him? None. Now, do you normally have a, uh, a belt tape or a, a, a lapel cam? Yes, I do. Did you have one on that day? I did, yes. Okay, and did you enter any video or audio into evidence from that scene? So the camera had malfunctioned. I did not. It was not operational. Okay. When, and when was the first time you realized that it had not been functioning? when I went to go look for the video on uh, our Buval system to download it appropriately. When you were at the scene and specifically when you were having interactions with the defendant, um, were you ever alone with the defendant where there were no other deputies around? Yes. Okay. And during that time, what kind of interaction did you have with him? None other than trying to identify him. Okay. And he gave you only his first name? That's correct. One second, Your Honor. Without, without saying um, any conversations that took place, did you also have conversations with another individual um, regarding this incident? That's other big, other than the calling party? It, yeah. Yeah, I spoke, the calling party did speak to me about the incident. Okay, anyone else? No. Okay. Not. Um, did you get any information from anybody else? None. Okay. Pass the witness. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Good morning, officer. Good morning. <clears throat> All right, now you testified that the initial call dispatching you came in around 5.40 p.m., is that correct? Correct. And you were on duty at that time? I was. And I think you even specified that you were in a marked patrol unit wearing your uniform badge of office. Correct. Where were you when you first received that dispatch around 5.40 p.m.? So I was stationary um, at the Santa Ana Police Department right off of Highway 528 and fi Highway 550. Santa Ana Police Station? Correct. Would that be in the lower district? That's in the lower district, correct. Okay. And so when you received this call at 5.40 p.m., what did you do? I proceeded to uh, the location of um, the coordinates. And when, you, when we're talking about you receiving this call or this dispatch, how are you receiving it? It's via radio. By radio? Yeah. And this is a radio that's in your vehicle? That's correct. Okay. And so these radio um, transmissions that are coming into your vehicle, those are coming from dispatch? Correct. And then you can radio back to them. Is that correct? That's correct. And every officer has what's called a call sign. Is that correct? That's correct. What was your call sign at that time? My call sign is SAM 236. SAM, so S-236. Yes. All right. And is there a place or a record that is created of these various radio transmissions that go back and forth? I believe with dispatch, yes. Okay. Would that be a CAD? Correct. And what does CAD stand for? Do you know? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't. It's a... No, like, I don't. Have you ever heard computer-aided dispatch? That, that's correct. Okay, so CAD stands for computer-aided dispatch. That's correct. And so that would be a written report of all these radio transmissions? Correct. And you've seen CAD reports before, haven't you? I have. In fact, you, you I mean, these are a standard record that you use in your, yeah, yeah, pra yes. in your career. Yes. Okay. So you get the call around 5.40 p.m., and you start to proceed to the location? That's correct. Yeah. How long does it take for you to actually arrive? Uh, the Whatever the time frame uh, when I arrived at 626, that, that was how long it took me to arrive. Okay, so 540 to 626. Correct. During that time, you're in your vehicle? Yes. You're hearing your radio? Yes. Okay. And would you agree then at 549, a radio dispatch went out indicating that the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, is that what BIA stands for? Yes. BIA had actually received a 911 call from a man named Dean Cummings. Uh, I, I didn't, they, that was not relayed over the radio. Are you aware that it's in the CADs? If, if it's in the CAD, it doesn't mean it was relayed to me over the radio. I did not hear it. You did not hear it. Yeah. So a computer-aided dispatch, which we just agreed, is a written record of radio transmissions. Yes. And that includes this 911 call at 549 from Dean Cummings. And you never heard that? I, I didn't hear the that, no. No. Okay. I will say that uh, everything in CAD dispatch doesn't always provide that information to us. Okay. So you arrive at the meeting point and you meet up with the calling party. That's correct. Was that David McCullough? Yeah, that's correct. That was David, yep. Okay. And he relayed to you information he received from Dean Cummings. Yes. Okay. Then you proceeded with Deputies Walker and Honey Stua over to the perimeter of this ranch? That's correct. Okay. Around what time did you arrive at the perimeter? Uh, it had to be shortly after, moments later, right after we met with the calling party. I want to say about another 10 minute to 15 minute time frame after uh, we met with our calling party. Okay. So that would have been around 
Six. Uh, six forty. Six forty. Okay. Now you had testified on direct exam that it was it would get dark around nine or ten p.m. Correct. This is February 29th. That's correct. Are you familiar with how the sun sets and rises in February? Yeah. Yes, I I am. So I would say more closer to nine. Okay. Is, is so you stand by the sun setting around 9 p.m. A, a, a little bit earlier than that. Okay. It was dark, you know, between 9 and 10. Is okay. the way that, that I took it. All right. So you think the sun sets around 9 o'clock? I, I can't testify to when the sun sets at night. Okay. Yeah. Do you recall what time the sun set last night? <laughs> Actually, yes, I can. What time did the sun set last night? I would say that it probably set it around... Eight o'clock last night. Eight o'clock. Yeah. Okay. When you arrived at the perimeter of this property, was it dark or light? It was light. It was still light? That is correct. All right. And you said you saw Mr. Cummings leaving the property. That is correct. Leaving the property and heading towards you, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So there's no allegation here he was trying to flee no. or evade? No. Okay. So he was driving right towards you? Correct. All right. And when he drove right towards you, he then stopped. Is that correct? That's correct. And he got out of his vehicle? That's correct. And he held his hands up in the air? That's correct. And he lifted up his shirt as ordered by deputies? That's correct. And then he laid down on the ground? That's correct. All of those were instructions given by your deputy to him? That's correct. And he fully complied with all of those instructions? Yes, he did. Okay. And he was cooperative? Yeah, uh, yes, he was. Okay. And he was taken into custody at that point in time? He was placed in investigative detention at that time, yes. So investigative detention, that means he's handcuffed, correct? Yes. Hands behind his back? Yes. And he was put in the back of a locked patrol car? Yes. Whose locked patrol car was he in? I don't recall. Was it yours? I don't recall. Okay. And was it at that point in time when he was taken into uh, investigative detention that you uh, asked his name? Yes. And what did he tell you? He identified himself as Dean. Okay. Did he tell you anything else? Uh, no. He, uh, no, he didn't. And this was at what time? This was initially right after we detained him. Um, this was between 6.40 and 7 p.m. Okay. Would 18.51 sound right? That sounds about right. Okay. So 18.51 is 6.51 p.m.? Yes. Correct? Okay. Yes. I always have to do the translation. Yes. It's not yeah. natural to me. <laughs> I, I understand, yeah. All right. So it was at 18.51 that he told you his first name but not his last name? It, it was a little bit after that. Okay. Yeah. A little bit how long after? Uh, about five, five minutes after. Okay. So a little bit after 1851 would be 1855. Sure. Okay. Well, in the CAD, around 1855, there's no mention of him refusing to provide his identity. Why is that? Uh, because I didn't call it out um, that he was refusing to identify himself. Well, officer... The problem with that statement is that at 1949, you do call out that he's refusing to identify himself. That's correct. So almost an hour later. Correct. That's how long I was trying to identify this individual. Okay. So for an hour, you're sitting there asking him his name? Uh, it is probably longer than that. It is probably about three hours of a time frame I was trying to identify this individual. I did ask him multiple times. Um, he started going off talking about other things that wasn't related, so I gave him some time to cool down, try to build a little bit report by asking him what his name was about 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, maybe 30 minutes later, I tried again, and I just couldn't identify this individual. So okay. I did finally call it out that he did refuse to identify himself. Okay, and so if your video camera had been working, it would have captured these attempts, is it, that correct? It sure would. Okay. 
Um, and you said that you did try to run your video camera that day. That's correct. And in fact, you told me specifically that you remember distinctly turning it on and off several times. That's correct. And you expected to have numerous videos capturing your involvement in this investigation. It, it, was, on, it was on the entire duration of the scene and then when I met with the uh, state police, that's correct. Right, and so you told me you had recorded every encounter you had with Mr. Cummings, with Mr. Cummings' father. So it was on record, that is correct, but the, like I said, the, the camera was not operational, so it did not record any of the incident. Go figure, on a case like this, that's pretty bad. It is pretty bad, yeah. I agree. No, I agree with I, your statement. Uh, so this video camera that you have, you use this on all of your call-outs, is that correct? That's correct. It wasn't just special to Mr. Cummings' case. That's correct. And so once a week, you go in and you download all those videos from the week before, is that correct? That's correct. And so you did that in this case? That's correct. And when you downloaded everything for that week that captures Mr. Cummings' investigation, you downloaded videos for other calls, is that correct? I don't recall. Well, you told me during our pretrial interview that you did download other videos for other cases. Okay, then it's pr probably so. And so when you did your weekly download, all other calls were videotaped except for this one. I w yes, that's correct. I will say this is the one case, go figure, that my lapel camera was not operational. Okay. That is correct. And you weren't wearing any sort of like an audio recorder belt tape? No. But Deputy Walker was. I don't know. Okay. I don't know what his recording device was. Okay. And your interactions with De um, with Mr. Cummings, those would have occurred at least in part when Deputy Walker was there. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Say that again. No, it probably wasn't a very good question. I apologize. So when you first arrived at the perimeter, Deputy Walker was with you, correct? Yes. And if his recorder was running at the time, that would have captured those moments that you were also present? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you conduct any sort of a search in this case? Uh, no, not that I recall. Okay. Did you go to the trailer? Once the, the scene was secured um, by the deputies, I did, yes. Okay. And did you see an AR-15 sitting next to the porch? I did. And Mr. Cummings had told you that he had put it there, didn't he? I don't recall. I don't believe he told me that. Okay. Did you create any diagrams in this case? No. Did you move anything? No. Did you collect any evidence? No. Did you use your cell phone? No. Did you take photos with your cell phone? No. Do you recall telling me during our interview that you used your cell phone to take pictures? Not my cell phone, not my personal cell phone. My department issued cell phone was utilized for pictures for the, for the search warrant. Okay, so you did take photos using a cell phone? With my department issued cell phone, yeah, sure. yes. Sure, okay. I, I took it as you were asking my personal cell phone if I took oh. pictures. No, with my department issued cell phone, I took pictures of uh, the property for the search warrant. Okay, and what happened with those photos that you took? They were uploaded to our patrol server, a secured server. What are Miranda warnings? <laughs> that, those are your rights, the Miranda rights. Are you familiar with them? Yes. Did you ever tell Mr. Cummings his Miranda rights? No. Regarding the photos you took with your department-issued cell phone, not your personal cell phone, your <laughs> department-issued cell phone, how many photos did you take? 
off the top of my head, it, it was very few. Um, I want to say about 10 photos is what I took. 10 photos. You said those were uploaded to a server? Yes. Okay. Have you ever seen those photos again? Um, what, what do you mean again? After I uploaded them? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I verified. I definitely checked again to make sure they were there. I checked last night to make sure they were there. Okay, because I've never seen them. Yeah. So I just yeah. didn't know where they went. Okay. Yeah, that's actually not true. They were part of the search warrant. Hold on. Let's, Hold on. Let, let's, let's move on. Okay. They're not the same photos that you guys asked about yesterday. Okay. All right. Thank you. I passed the witness. Okay. Yeah. Say, redirect. <clears throat> well, let, let's just clarify. The photos that you took were used to obtain the search warrant, correct? That's correct. It was just of the property structure, the, which way the door was facing. Which were part of the affidavit for the search warrant, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Now, you said that you uh, tried for uh, some length of time to get the defendant's identity, and he gave you his first name, but did he give you any other identifiers, like his date of birth? He, he, he did say a, a date of birth that was incorrect. Okay. Did he give you more than one date of birth? He, he did keep changing um, his date of birth. Okay. <coughs> and... Ms. Moss asked you about meeting up with the defendant's father. What was that all about? His father wanted to speak with us. Um, I, I met with his father. His father said that he was there. His son. Hit. Why did you meet up with his father without saying what the father said? To try and identify Dean. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Moss asked you about the fact that the defendant voluntarily came out of, stopped his truck. Do you recall um, one of your fellow deputies using his PA to tell him to stop his truck and get out of his truck? Yes. Thank you. Pass the witness. Your Honor, I'd ask for a brief redirect. On what subject? Recross. Recross. I'm sorry. I'll allow it because he's on your witness list too, but, no, but then the state has a chance to recross that. Am I going to re redirect? Specific. Re redirect. Officer, you just testified on redirect that Mr. Cummings gave you a date of birth but kept changing that date of birth. Correct. Do you include that information anywhere in your one page police report? That he refused to identify himself is, it, it, it should be in there. Okay. You don't include in your police report that he gave you his first name. To be specific, if you're asking, asking if I'm there specifically about his first name and then the date of birth, no. That is what I, I'm asking you. No, I just put in there he refused to identify himself. Okay, which isn't entirely true because he gave you his first name. It, it is. Well, hold on. Let, let, hold on. Let finish asking the question you answer it and so forth okay it it is it is true he did hinder my investigation to appropriately identify somebody i need more than just a name i do need his full name and date of birth i need a social i need a driver's license i can identify him any one of those ways which he failed to provide and uh disclose to me okay and you failed to put in your report any information regarding him refusing to give his date of birth uh, I just put in there that he refused to identi identify himself. Okay, and my question to you, again, was did you fail to put that he refused to give his date of birth in your report? The, there's none of that information is in that report. All right, thank you. Any re redirect? One question. Okay. Did you indicate to the defendant what the consequences would be if he didn't fully identify himself? I did. I told him you're about to be charged with concealing identity if I can't appropriately identify you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to choose this witness. He'll be subject to recall. I don't want you discussing your testimony with anyone, right? Yes, sir. But they may call you, they may not. All right? Yes, sir. Ooh. 
we're going to take a 15-minute recess, and because of the situation, I'm going to need everyone to clear the courtroom, and that way we'll leave the, the jury here within the courtroom by themselves. So we'll take a 15-minute break, okay? All right. All right. <clears throat>
Thomas Come up here, let me swear you in. Take it right now, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give the truth on the penalty of law? I do. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Could you please state and spell your name for the court reporting? Oh, I still have to have it for that. Okay, no worries. <laughs> My name is Thomas Griffin, T H O M A S G R I F F I N. Okay, and thank you, sir. Where do you work? I currently work at Sandoval County Sheriff's Office. And what is your position, sir? I am the detective sergeant over criminal investigation division. And are you a full-time sworn salaried commissioned peace officer? Yes, ma'am, I am. Tell us about your career in law enforcement. Uh, I got approximately 16 years in law enforcement, uh, 12 of them on the streets as a patrol deputy slash sergeant. Uh, currently now have almost four years as a detective slash sergeant. And have you always worked for the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office? No, ma'am. I started my career at Taos PD. I uh, came here, went to Los Lunas PD, Sandia PD, and here. And um, the, your time at Taos PD and all the other law enforcement entities, is that included in the six years or is that 16 years or is that in addition to the Yes, ma'am. That's all together. Not me. Okay. And um, what was your assignment in 2020? I was the detective sergeant. How long were you in that position, sir, at that point? In Approximately a year. And what were your duties as the detective sergeant? I oversee the criminal investigation <laughs> division. I have two other detectives. On that day, I was on call. How many detectives does the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office have? Uh, currently one, but besides me, but we're slotted for two other positions. Okay. Um, what kind of training have you undergone? Uh, I have large quantities of training, probably 700 and something hours of advanced training. Have you done any trainings related to um, homicide investigations? Yes, ma'am. Uh, criminal investigations on both homicide and suicides and documenting the scenes. Now, um, I'm going to ask some, since you've been with Sandoval County Sheriff's Office for a while, I'm just going to ask some background questions about your department. In February 2020, did the deputies have belt tapes or body camera videos? Uh, some had belt tapes, some had body cam. They kind of ran both, depending on who, because a lot of deputies bought their own at the time, because the department didn't have uh, enough cameras. Okay. And um, if you know, in February 2020, did the deputies have um, a computer-aided dispatch system in their vehicles? Uh, no, ma'am. They didn't have CAD, I don't believe. Okay. We were still running the old system. What's the old system? What does that mean? Uh, it, it was a different system where we had to document everything from the car, but it wasn't linked to dispatch in any way. Okay. So was it just over the radio then? Everything was dispatched through the radio. And then there's maybe some operator somewhere keeping notes of what is being transmitted yes, over the radio? Yes, ma'am. That would be the dispatch. Okay. Um, let's talk about February 29th, 2020. Were you on duty at about 1740? Uh, I was on call, so they called me out for that. So at that time, I was notified. Okay. And what time was that? Uh, approximately 630, I believe. And um, what were your duties on that date? I was on call as the on-call deputy, or detective, rather. Okay. So tell me what happened. 
uh, I was notified of a possible shooting by Lieutenant Tomlinson and given grid coordinates for the location due to its uh, remote location. So from there, I went, took me approximately one hour to get to the general area just because it's so dark out there after dark, there's no way to find your way unless you know exactly where you're going. Do you remember what time it got dark that day? I don't know. I, it was dark when I got there, so. Okay, what time did you arrive, sir? Uh, an hour later, so it'd be 7.30ish. Okay. And you said you were dispatched based on GPS coordinates? Yes, ma'am. They give me the general location, GPS location, but then the de uh, deputies would meet me and bring me in. Okay. Just because it's easy to get lost after dark. Can you tell or describe to the jury what it was like driving out there on uh, that day? It's dark. I mean, extremely dark. There's no lights. This is uh, Cabazon Peak. If any of y'all have been there, it's, it's pretty remote in itself. Uh, the residence is approximately a mile and a half, I believe, from there, further into the Mesa. Uh, on, all, on all the sides, there's hills, part of the mountain, the peaks so much. So there is no light sources whatsoever out there. So at night, it's dark. And what were the roads like? Uh, dirt, uh, bumpy ruts from arroyos, so on. Okay. Um, before we talk about your observations when you arrive on scene, sir, can you tell us about some of the difficulties you had in communicating when you were out there? Uh, due to its remote location, uh, radios didn't work very well. Uh, Handhelds didn't work at all. That means your handheld radios, so they didn't. So only car radios would be able to get out. Uh, cell phones on scene were non-existent, pretty much. So how were you able to relay messages to dispatch? Uh, somebody would have to leave site, scene, drive up the road to approximately the Cabazon Peak area, which is a mile and a half to call. Okay, so if you needed to talk to dis dispatch, you would have to send someone a mile and a half down the road? Correct. To call, and would you call by cell phone? We'd call by cell phone. Yes. Did your um, radios and the cars work on site? Uh, some of them did, some of them didn't. I think it just depended on where they were located. Okay. Um, so what time did you arrive on scene? Uh, I got there an hour after I was dispatched, so you figure 7.30. Uh, I stopped along the way to talk to Mr. McCullough, uh, okay. who was the reporting party. Uh, he gave a general statement. I told him, look, uh, somebody will interview you later. Uh, he just told us what generally happened. They got written reports, and we're going to document it. Okay. And um, what deputy did you do meet at that point? I want to say that was Deputy Latham at the time. Okay. So what happened next? I proceeded to the scene myself and Deputy Gutierrez, who is now Ford. Uh, we continued on to the site. She was with me for taking pictures. At the time, I didn't have a good camera. She was on duty, so... Uh, I asked her to come with me, so she had a good camera on scene. And did you guys ride two men, or were you in separate vehicles? Separate vehicles. Okay. She was the uh, traffic unit at the time. Okay. So um, when you get to the scene or the residence or the ranch, what happened? Upon arrival, I'm notified that there's one deceased male inside the house. The other one was already in the back of a vehicle being detained. Uh, he was complaining of being sprayed by some chemical and that EMS was already on the way. Okay, how long, if you know, was it before EMS arrived? I couldn't give you an exact answer. Okay, and um, was it the same thing for EMS? Did somebody have to meet them a couple of miles down the road and drive them to the ranch? Uh, no, ma'am, actually EMS is pretty good out in the Navajo Nation, that's who it is. They know that area because that is their one area. So they go down all the roads, so they were able to make it to it. Okay. And um, were you present when Mr. Cummings was evaluated by EMS? Uh, he was in the back of the truck, so we don't uh, get present when that when he's doing that due to medical purposes. So we stay back. Okay. But you saw him seen. get into the... He is in the truck. The doors are open for safety purposes, but he's being evaluated, and I don't hear any of their conversations. Okay. Thank you, sir. And um, you were able to observe Mr. Cummings on the evening of February 29th. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Did you see any injuries on Mr. Cummings? Uh, no physical evidence that was there. He, did, he wasn't read in any way. Uh, when he stepped out of the vehicle, after he's done being seen by EMS, we asked to photograph him real quick, and during which time he expressed that he was sprayed by an unknown chemical, and it was 
and neurologically messing with his functions or something along those lines. And uh, explained that he was sprayed by something, he'd changed clothes, and he'd washed his face before we arrived. Uh, while he was doing that, he told me that uh, he wanted us, told me where he put the, car, the clothes, which was in the back of his pickup truck, and told us that he wanted us to test it for the chemical agent. Okay. Um, before we move on to that, um, when you guys were taking photos of Mr. Cummings on that evening, um, did you observe any blood or anything like that on his clothing? Uh, no, ma'am. Did he complain of any burns on his hands? Uh, not that I recall. Please be patient. Let me just number these real quick. Yes, ma'am. It's impossible to number in advance. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. I'm approaching you with what's been marked. Yes, ma'am. Do you recognize those? Yes, ma'am. What are those? These are the pictures that Ms. Gutierrez took of him once he exited the EMS truck. Okay, and you were present when these photos were taken? Yes, ma'am. Do they appear to be in the same or similar condition as when they were taken? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Your Honor, the state moves admission of exhibits 16 through 23. No objection. They'll be admitted. <clears throat> and permission to publish? Yes. States Exhibit 16. Is this Mr. Cummings on the night of the incident? Yes, ma'am, that is. And this is, a meet we can see the EMS van right behind him, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is. Um, did you observe any scratches, abrasions, or anything of that nature on Mr. Cummings? Uh, nothing that was physical. I think he has two little marks on his hands, uh, unknown if they're relative, but... There was uh, no marks that would show that he was sprayed by any type of mace. States Exhibit 17 I'm putting under the document camera. Is this a close-up of Mr. Cummings' face? Yes, ma'am. Did he have any um, swelling of the eyes or redness or anything like that? Uh, no, ma'am, he does not. I'm putting under the document camera states exhibit 18. And what is this a picture of? That's a picture of his torso and legs. I'm putting under the document camera states exhibit 19. <coughs> and what is this a photo of? 
That is his legs and feet. And this is the items of clothing he was wearing when he encountered the stuff. That is correct. I'm putting under the document camera states exhibit 20. What is this a picture of? That is the back side of his torso. That is a picture of his hands, and that would be the little marks on his hands I was referring to. Can you please point to them or circle them on your screen there, sir, that you were referencing? Just little cut marks, probably working on something, because they don't look appear fresh in any way. I'm putting under the... <coughs> Bottom. There we go. Things exhibit 22. And what is this a photo of? Uh, his hands again. And states exhibit 23. What is this a photo of? His palms. Did he complain of any injuries on his palms? Not that I recall. So you testified that Deputy Kateras took these photos. What happened next while you were on scene? Uh, once he told us where the clothes were, we uh, secured those. The clothes were in the back of his pickup truck. They were in the bed. And once, once we go to tow this vehicle, all of them would have flown out. And he'd already given us permission to test them for purposes of the chemicals. So we put those into evidence bags. They were slightly wet. They were put into paper bags so they could dry. Okay, so um, why did you have to move the vehicle? The vehicle was blocking the entrance way. It's, uh, the road's rather slim. It's got barbed wire on either side. It's to keep animals in and out of the area. Uh, Mr. Ariola was a landscaper, so he did a pretty good job with the fence. It wasn't something I could just take down so I could move stuff around. So I had to move the vehicle out of the way so we could get other vehicles in. And what items of clothing did Mr. Cummings identify as him having worn? Uh, he said he just put the clothes in the back and the clothes that I found were a jacket, I believe it was camouflage in color, a whoopee, which is military for internal uh, uh, liner for your jacket for the camouflage jacket and a I believe a t-shirt did he ever identify any shoes that he was wearing uh no ma'am not that i recall so let me mark these Let's back up a little bit here. Um, did you assist with any warrant for the residents? I walked the perimeter and we took pictures, I say. We, as in myself and <laughs> Deputy Guterres, okay. walked the scene and made sure that, more or less, to see what all I needed for the scene, just because we're in such a remote area, what I needed to facilitate it and to get pictures for a search warrant. Okay. What is a search warrant? A search warrant's a is a legal document authorizing us to go on a scene and to search the premises and to take things that are in the parameters of that warrant. Okay, so you go and canvas the scene, you said, to get information for the warrant. What did you observe during your canvas? I uh, walked approximately 100 yards to the first area. There's an RV as you're walking in in a parking area in a rock pit if you continue on there's a trailer where there was a rifle leaning against the stairs that was already cleared that had a magazine on the steps next to it uh, you could also see what appeared to be bullet holes coming out of the porch area okay and can you describe to the jury what the lighting conditions were like out there 
again, uh, we're dealing with uh, complete dark, so we're using flashlights. Uh, I think there may have been limited lighting because it, he does ha there was a solar system there, so there may be lights inside, but outside there wasn't a whole lot. And what was the temperature like? Considering it's February, I'd say pretty cool. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. I'm approaching you with what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 24 to 28. Thank you, ma'am. Can you please look at those and tell me if you recognize them? Yes, ma'am. What is that? That is the pictures that Deputy Gutierrez took of the the white truck that was Mr. Uh, Cummings' truck that was blocking the roadway, uh, the back of his vehicle, clothes in the back of his vehicle, uh, the rifle leaning against the stairs, and a close-up of the magazine laying next to it. And how do you know? I was present with it. I was pointing out what I needed pictures taken of. Okay. And um, do they appear to be in the same condition as when they were taken? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, the state moves admission of exhibits 24 through 28. You'll be admitted. May I approach? You may. <clears throat> and permission to publish, Your Honor? You may. I'm putting under the document camera state's exhibit 24. What is that a photograph of, sir? That is a picture of Mr. Cummings' Ram 5500 pickup truck. Okay. And um, can you describe a little bit about the environment of the truck? Uh, it's parked right in the roadway. So as you can see, the fences are to the left of it, and there's one right in front where we're taking pictures of. So it's blocking the roadway. And I'm putting under the document camera state exhibit 25. What is that a photograph of, That's sir? showing the bed of the vehicle and the condition it was in. And I'm putting under the document camera states exhibit 26. And what is that a photograph of? That is a picture of the clothing that Mr. Cummings said he put in the back of it. And are those the items of clothing that you collected? Yes, ma'am, they are. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the items of clothing. Um, you indicated that... Tell us about the condition of the clothing when you collected it. Uh, they were slightly wet, like I said earlier. Uh, there was no odor to be had for any type of chemical that I could smell. Uh, we were put them in a bags and sealed them. Okay. And um, what did you do with those bags? They were taken back to evidence once I left scene and put into the evidence locks okay. and vaults. And have you ever been maced before? Uh, yes, ma'am. How many times? Uh, probably four or five, directly. Have you been present when somebody else has been maced? Yes, ma'am. How many times? Good 20. And that doesn't even include the times we spray dogs, spray near dogs to get them away from us. How many times have you been present when mace was pr sprayed? Probably 100. Does it have a distinct smell? Yes, ma'am, very chemically. Can you please describe it for the jury? Uh, uh, it's a chemical smell. Depending on if what type it is, it can have like almost a tangy, if you will. It has that uh, makes your skin just stand up instantly. It's like taking a really, really, really hot uh, jalapeno, and how that feels. That's you get it just being in the room from smelling it. And um, in the hundred times that you've been present when it was sprayed. Has it ever gotten on anybody's clothing? Uh, yes, ma'am. How does that affect the clothing? Uh, you can, it's very strong odor. It doesn't go away. It's not something that you just wipe off. This chemical takes a while. Even if you wash it, it takes a little bit to come out. And in the times that you were present when somebody was sprayed with mace, not a dog, but a, a human, um, what are some of the physical things that you've seen happen to people? 
uh, reddening instantly. It's, uh, it's almost a chemical burn on you. Uh, your eyes instantly start shutting. You, you're watering constantly. It's, it feels like it's hard to breathe while you're getting it. And um, does water affect it? Uh, yes, ma'am, but not in the way you would hope. Uh, it causes the chemicals to react a second time, and it's almost like getting maced again. So uh, even if you shower, it can be very uncomfortable getting it off because it spreads. And in your opinion, when you made contact with Mr. Cummings, did he exhibit any of those characteristics you just testified to of someone who had just been sprayed with mace? No, ma'am. So I'm putting under the document camera states exhibit 27. What is that a photo of? That is a picture of the AR style rifle that was leaning against the steps. And is that the position in which the rifle was located? Yes, ma'am. And I'm putting under the document camera states exhibit 28. What is that a photograph of? That is a picture of the barrel with the magazine sitting on the steps that was cleared from the weapon. Okay. Did you have any information who cleared that weapon? I was advised that uh, Mr. Cummings did it. And do you guys confirm to make sure that the weapon is safe? I did not touch that weapon. Okay. Um, so you, clear, you go through the scene to get warrants. What happens next? Once a warrant is received, we get permission to do it. Uh, state police was notified due to the homicide scenes. We have state police come out because they have better equipment. Let's be honest, they get a lot more funding. They have uh, digital imaging and stuff like that that can actually do a better job than we can. So is it typical for the New Mexico State Police to process scenes for the Sandoval County Sheriff's <coughs> Office? Uh, yes, ma'am, major uh, homicides and stuff like that. And um, did you remain on scene the entire time while state police processed the scene? Yes, ma'am. How long did that take them? I can't give you an exact time. I didn't leave till the next day at almost 2 o'clock, I believe. Um, what happened next while they're processing the scene? Uh, they're processing the scene. We're waiting. I eventually go and make contact with them just to check on them, and they kind of walk me through what they had so far about several bullets, walls, et cetera. Okay. And... Um, Were, were any vehicles towed from the scene? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, two motor vehicles and a trailer. Okay. And then after state police finished processing the scene and vehicles were towed, you said you left at about 2 p.m. the next day? Yes, ma'am. Where did you go after that? Uh, to the sheriff's office. I have to put all the evidence into the evidence lockers because okay. I signed for it. So when state police does a crime scene, They'll evaluate it, they document it, they box everything up, and then they it's signed over to a detective on scene in which we put it into our evidence. And you were the person who signed for all of the evidence? Yes, ma'am, I was. Okay. And um, where, did the, where did the evidence go when you collected it? I took it to the sheriff's office and put it in the vault. And how did the evidence get to the New Mexico Department of Public Safety Lab? That it, it's sent from, through our evidence tech. What items were submitted to the lab, do you know? I do not know all the answers to that one. That would be the lieutenant who sent them. Okay. Um, did you happen to bring gloves, sir? Yes, ma'am, I got some. Okay.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're going to break for lunch. It's a little bit before 12, but be back at 1.15. Let me just remind you of my research instruction from yesterday. So let's break for lunch. Be back uh, a little bit before 1.15. We'll get started around 1.15 in the afternoon. All right. So let's be in recess till then. All right.
Good afternoon, you may be seated. Are we calling that witness out of order, Mr. Domo? Um, yes, Your Honor. Today's next witness will be David McCullough. Okay, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, for, because of a scheduling issue, we're calling a witness out of order. We're calling another witness. Uh, and then we'll bring back the last witness when we're done with this witness. Sorry, Your Honor, we're just managing witnesses That's okay. out there. Okay, here he comes. You want to go ahead and sit up there at that witness stand? And be careful with your step there. And before you take a seat, I need to swear you in so you can raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give the truth of the county law? Yes. And then when you take the seat, get close to the hand up. Get close to the microphone and speak out loud. Right? Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Could you please state and spell your last name for the court reporter? David McCullough. M C C U L L O C H. Um, approach the bench. Yes. I'm going to let him take off his mask so we can hear him better. Okay, I can, I, we can do that. Okay. Mr. McCullough, I'm, I'm going to let you take off your mask when you testify that way, and we can hear you better, okay? Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. So, uh, Mr. McCullough, can you tell the jury what you do for a living? Uh, I'm currently retired from the VA hospital. Okay. And what did you do when you worked at the VA hospital? I worked at the VA for 30 years as a physician assistant in the GU department, urology. Okay, great. <clears throat> How long have you been retired? Uh, since the end of December 2017. That's great. Um, so we're going to talk about s some events that happened on February 29th of 2020. Do you remember that day? Yes. Tell us what was going on that day. Uh, I was out for a motorcycle ride. Uh, the area up by Cabazon is kind of pretty and um, there's dirt roads that go everywhere, so I was exploring that. Um, I drove down to a spot that's about one mile directly west of Cabazon Peak. Uh, and there's actually a point of interest sign right there. And I was going to read it, but there were a bunch of other people there, so I thought, I'll ride on down the road some more. Do you and remember, then, before you go on, sir, do yes. you remember about what time of day this was? The afternoon. The afternoon? I'm retired. <laughs> I don't pay attention to that stuff. Okay. Um, please continue, sir. You said. So I rode 
I rode further down the road. Uh, I can't, the road really winds a lot, but I came to a, a Y intersection, and it seemed to go straight, so I stayed to the right, and I went down until the road dead end. Uh, then I got the bike turned around, and as I started heading back north, um, off to my left, which would have been west, I could see some buildings probably 500 yards away. And I thought I saw a man walking over there, but I was more focused on trying to keep the bike upright on this kind of rough, sandy road. I rode back up to the point of interest sign, which I wanted to read. I parked the bike, and I was reading the sign. <clears throat> and, uh, and a man drove up in a white pickup truck, and uh, he was talking about different things. He said he he owned motorcycles, and he liked my motorcycle. And uh, then he drove off, and I went back to reading the point of interest sign, and then a few minutes later he drove back, and we talked some more. And then I looked at my watch, and by then it was getting closer to about 5 o'clock. And I, I was thinking I really needed to get home. I wanted to get home before dark, because I don't like driving these windy dirt roads in the dark. <clears throat> so I started walking back to the motorcycle, and he says, wait a minute, need wave me back over. And I said, what? And he said, he said, I'm in a little bit of trouble and I need some help. He says, I just shot a man and uh, I've tried to call the authorities, but I can't get cell service. If you have cell service, can you call them for me? So I pulled out my cell phone and called 911 and uh, started talking to the operator about this guy who had just told me he'd shot somebody. And uh, um, truly, cell service was bad because the signal disappeared. Actually, it disappeared several times. The, the calls got cut off. How many times do you think you had to attempt to call 911? I called the first time, and then I just waited, and they called me back. But it was at least my call and two or three others. OK. Um, when you first encountered, the first time you encountered this male on this road, what was his demeanor like? Um, well, he seemed sort of friendly. I mean, he's asking me about my motorcycle and sharing that he had motorcycles. Um, some of his conversation seemed a little disjointed. Um, Did he seem to you to be calm or upset or... Can you describe his demeanor to the jury? I, I guess calm because I never much thought about it. I mean, if you're asking, if, was he hysterical or screaming or crying? No. Okay. Now, the, the male that you encountered out there at the road, um, is he in the courtroom today, sir? I honestly don't know. Okay. Um, and you can take a minute to look around. And just for the, I've already stipulated that this is Mr. Cummings. Okay. okay. 
Uh, well, first starters, he has a mask on. Yes, we all do, uh, right. You know, his hair is different. It, it was uh, sort of long and sort of straggly. And it's, uh, okay. Do you remember what he was wearing when you encountered no. him? No. Um, it, it wasn't a suit. Okay. <laughs> um, when you encountered Mr. Cummings, did you observe any injuries on him? No. Um, so you said that he waved you back. How long of a time period did you encounter him or spend with him before he told you that he had shot a guy? Just the whole thing, the first encounter plus the second encounter. I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes. Not, was, not very long. Was it less than an hour? Oh, yes. Less than half an hour? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think about that because, like I said, I really wanted to read this point of interest. On it. <laughs> and, uh, and they're not that long. Yeah. So, you know, I just wanted to read it and uh, look at the peak and, and then get bundled up on my motorcycle and get my helmet on and head home. So after you called 911, actually, Your Honor, at this time the state would request permission to publish to the dur jury state's exhibit one, which has already been admitted by stipulation? Yeah, we, okay. we, we stipulate. And Mr. McCullough, I'm going to go ahead and play the 911 audio. Okay. Uh, I'm west of Cabazon Peak. Okay, Cabazon Peak. How far west? Uh, I guess about my, uh, from directly west of Cabazon Peak. It's now some dirt roads. Okay, and off uh, 1114? I hopped on the motorcycle and went for a ride. Okay. I mean, you know, there's a paved road that comes off 550 uh -huh. and it goes west. Okay, what's going on? Are you lost? So, so the reason I'm calling is I ran into a guy, ran into a guy here who said he was attacked at a ranch. And he wound up pulling a gun and shooting the guy who attacked him. Okay. And he can't get cell service, and he asked me to call 911. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, just bear with me. I'm getting all this information in the call, okay? Does it look like the other male needs an ambulance? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, okay. I was out on the motorcycle. Uh -huh. I stopped at the sign at Kevin's on Peak reading about the history. And this guy in the truck pulls up next to me. So somebody just attacked him on a ranch down the road somewhere. And he's, he's in the truck that's called the H2O Guide Service. Mm -hmm. There's a license. There is a lapse. So 
So, Mr. McCullough, that is that the first call you made? Yes. And we can hear some talking in the background. Who is talking in the background? Do you remember? I don't know. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and play the second audio. Hello? No, sir, it's my own one again, okay? We got disconnected. Yeah, yeah. like I said, I'm not out of the cabin, so I'm surprised I can make a call at all. Yeah, it, when you call 911, it will run with any service. It doesn't matter which provider you're with. So I'm just going to try and stay on the phone with you as long as possible because this obviously is kind of, this is serious, so I just want to make sure that you're okay as well. So this guy is on the other phone and he's trying to call somebody to get some help. Okay. So do you think this guy needs a hand with? I don't know, do you see if he's bleeding or anything? I'm sorry, what's that? Can you see if he's bleeding, or does he look okay? The guy I'm talking to seems fine, but he says he shot this other guy. He said he shot another guy? Yes. Yeah, he said this other guy attacked him, trying to kill him, and he pulled the gun and then shot the other guy. Okay, does he know if the other male is still alive? Or does he not know? Do you know if the guy is alive? He says no. He says he's dead? Yes. What kind of vehicle is, the, is he in? Is he in a truck? He's in a Dodge Ram 5500. Big sticker on the side says H2O guy. He said it's some sort of helicopter ski guy service. It's got an electric plate. Okay. Okay, and are you are you safe, sir? Sir? Sir, can you hear me? Mr. McCullough, was that the second call? Yes. And Mr. McCullough, we could hear someone talking in the background on that call. Is that correct? Yes. Who was that, if you remember? I think it was Mr. Cummings. Now I'm going to play the third audio file. Sandoval County Police Fire and Rescue, this is Maria. How can I help you? <laughs> uh, I've been on the phone with uh, an officer, but I keep getting cut out because I'm Okay, sir, where are you? Is it? Okay. So 
the line seems the line's still open, but there's nothing there. All right. Now, Mr. McCall, I'm going to play the fourth and final audio file. Okay. Okay, are you safe, sir? Yes. Okay. Do you know the name of the ranch that where this person he shot is? Yes. Do you know the name of the ranch? No, he says he doesn't. He says this guy's first name is Dino. Dino. Leo or Hello? Hello, sir. Well, yeah. do you know the name of the ranch? No, it doesn't. Okay. Okay, no problem. Do you, does he know how far it is from where you are? Yes. <laughs> He's up, come talk to the police officer somewhere. I don't know. He's, he's pretty shook up, but he's, he's trying to get some help out here. Okay, yeah, we're getting help out to you, don't worry. But I'm just trying to make sure I can get as much information. Yeah. Um, Okay. Do you, do you know if somebody's on the way? Uh, we're getting people out that they're being dispatched basically since we started talking. Um, okay. But I'm gonna, I would like to stay on the phone with you, okay? Just just stay there if you can turn on your hazard lights. Um, Actually, yeah. Do you know if he's still got the gun on him? I'm pretty sure he's got it. Okay. What would you, what would you like? To... It doesn't mean it's a place where police officers come up and see him with a gun. What would you like him to do? Okay. If he's got it on him, just to follow the instructions the officers tell him, and to um, and to not have it in his hands, okay, and just to keep okay. his hands visible. Huh? Just huh? yeah, just follow the instructions of the law enforcement. Whatever they advise him to do, just let him, just tell him to follow their instructions. Where did he, does he know where he shot him? Was it in the head and the torso? Um, What was this first name? Dio. 
He's like I said, he's talking to somebody. I don't know. He's talking to someone else. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. He's uh, he's not going anywhere. I mean, he's seriously waiting. Okay. Waiting for somebody to get him. Stay with me because I'm also one of. Okay, Mr. McCullough. Um, before we move on, I just have a couple of follow up questions. Sure. So, in that first 911 audio, we heard you say that Mr. Cummings told you he was attacked. Can you please um, tell us what Mr. Cummings told you? <clears throat> he said. This other guy had attacked him and sprayed him with some poison. He said the poison burned his skin and burned his face and burned his eyes, and it made it difficult to breathe. He, he told me he thought he was going to die from this poison. Okay. And what did, did he say what happened after the poison? No. Um, did he ever tell you that after he shot the guy, he washed his face or shirt? Or yes. Tell us what he said. He said that um, this poison that was on his skin uh, was burning him and his eyes and face. And so he went to... Uh, uh, water faucet, one of those outdoor water faucets with the big curved handles. And he said he got his clothes, got his shirt off, and washed all the stuff off as best he could. Okay. And at this point, are you guys still at the Cabazon Peak sign of interest? He told me that he wanted me to go with him back to the ranch because he wanted me to be his witness that this guy has, had attacked him. And I wasn't, you know, I couldn't witness anything like that, but I did want to see if this man was still alive. If he was still alive, then maybe there's something I could do for him. You know, I've got over 30 years of medical experience. If he was still breathing and alive, maybe there was something I could do. So we drove, <clears throat> we drove down this windy dirt road back to almost that dead end I had told you about. And we pulled in where those buildings were and parked. And we walked over to this brown mobile home and walked inside. And immediately to the right, there's a small room. And there was a guy laying face down on the floor, and he wasn't moving, he wasn't breathing, he wasn't doing anything. To, to me, it, he looked dead, he, he was dead. Um, in his right hand, he had a black canister of some sort, which uh, that's what Mr. Cummings wanted me to see that that this guy had attacked him with this canister of something. Why do you say that Mr. Cummings wanted you to see this canister? 
he he said he wanted me to be a witness that this guy actually had this poison in his hand. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your observations of the residents. Um, when you go to this trailer, was it still daylight? Yeah, sort of. I mean, at this point, it must have been about 5, after 5 p.m., and in February, that means, you know, it was getting, the sun was getting low in the sky. But yes, it was still daylight. Okay. And um, when you entered the residence, was the doors opened or closed? The front door was closed but not locked. And when we walked in, uh, the, the door to that bedroom where the, the dead guy was, that was open. Okay. Um, and the room, can you describe the room to the jury? The, the mobile home looked like a bunkhouse. It looked like a bunkhouse that would be used at a cattle ranch where you'd have lots of Folks bunking, there were bunks built out of two by fours. You could probably sleep a dozen or so people in these bunk beds. There were some, the room to the left as you went in was a much larger room, but it was still mostly bunk beds. And in the right, there were some bunk beds and there was a small kitchen straight ahead. And when you went into the residence, sir, did you smell anything that smelled like poison? No. Um, were the windows open or closed, if you know? I don't know. Okay. Um, the bedroom where you saw the body, was this a big bedroom or a small bedroom? It's small, I would guess. Not more than 10 feet wide and 12, 10 by 12, maybe smaller. Okay. And um, did you have to like turn sideways to go into the door of the bedroom or what was the doorway like? Was it pretty small as well? Um, to enter the building, the door was closed, so I had to go in and around that door to see to the doorway to that small bedroom. But that door was open. I didn't have to go in, around. And, and did it, you check the mail that you saw on the ground? Can you tell us, was he face up or face down? Face down. Were you, did you check his vitals or do anything like that? No, he looked pretty gray. There was no, no breath, no movement of the chest. And by this time, it must have been an hour or so since, um, since Mr. Cummings had told me that he shot somebody. So um, he hadn't moved or anything. Did you touch anything in that room? No. Okay. And um, when you observed the other the living room area part in the small kitchen that you talked about, did it appear that there were chairs overturned or any evidence that there was some sort of fight or anything like that? Nothing obvious to me. I guess, I guess I'm not sure how to answer that because, like I said, it, it was very much a cowboy's bunk, bunk house. Okay. I mean... Where was Mr. Cummings when you went into the house? To he was with me. Okay. Was he behind you or in front of you? He went in ahead of me, and then he was standing to the side of me, and he was pointing out the canister in the, in the guy's hand. Okay. So what happened next after you? So we left the mobile home, and he pointed out the 
the water faucet outside where he said he had washed himself and washed his clothes and got the poisons off of, off of him. And then um, and then I, I told him that I was going to head back to that point of interest sign to meet the police because for sure they'd never, they'd never find that spot if, if, uh, if somebody didn't go back and lead them back, they'd never find him. And he said he'd be right behind me. I told him, I, I told him a few things. The first one was, I said that when the police come, do not have that gun in your hands. So let's talk about the gun. Did he ever tell you where the gun was? No. Wait, he said it was in the truck, but I never saw it. In fact, I still don't know what kind of firearm it was. I don't know if it was a pistol or a shotgun or what. I have okay. no Did idea. Did he say if it was in the cab of the truck or the bed of the truck? He said it was in the bed of the truck under the clothes. Okay. Um, after, did you then proceed out of the ranch area to the to meet up with law enforcement? Yes, I, I left there, uh, got back on my motorcycle and drove up and he said he'd be right behind me. I drove back to that point of interest sign. By this time, it was definitely getting dark and I could see the flashing lights of the police cars closer to Cabazon Peak. And so I just parked right by that sign, turned on my flashers on the motorcycle, <laughs> and uh, then I just stood sort of in front of the bike so they could see me in my headlights, and I just waited for them. Okay, and did the man follow you? No. No, okay. How long do you estimate it took for law enforcement to meet you at that sign? From the time of the calls? Yes, sir. It was a long time. It was 45 minutes or an hour. It was a long time. It, it seemed like a really long time. Yes, sir. Um, so what happened next after you met up with law enforcement? So they, they came to me. I handed them my driver's license because I knew they'd want that information. They asked me what happened. And I explained everything, and they said, well, where's the guy? I said, I don't know. He said he'd be right behind me, but that was 15 minutes ago. So I, I don't know what happened. Okay. Did you um, lead law enforcement back to the ranch? Um, so by then there were, I think, three police cars, well, pickup trucks, and they put me in the back of one, and then we started down the road. And I, they stopped at one intersection, and they said, is right or left? And I said, right. So they went straight down there. They stopped at another intersection. They said, is this one? By then I could barely see. It was really dark. I said, no, I think it's the next one. And I told them, don't worry, because at the very least, we'll go down until we hit the dead end, and then it's the next turn in up from the dead end. So we went down to the next turn, turn off to the right, and, uh, and they said, is this one? And I could just barely see the reflection of the last bits of sunlight on the roof of the trailer. And I said, yes, this is it. So we stopped, they had their lights on, they were discussing what to do. Okay. And I'm, I'm not sure what happened there because I was still inside the pickup truck and they were outside trying to figure out what was going on. But apparently Mr. Cummings 
came forward and they had their rifles because they weren't sure what to expect either. Okay. And uh, they told him. Through and without a, saying what anybody else said, um, did they place Mr. Cummings in the back of a patrol car? Yes, he came up. They told him to put his hands behind him. They handcuffed him. They put him in the back of a... No. Okay, and did you um, give a statement to law enforcement? Yes. I wrote, wrote out something for them as well. All righty. And how long do you think that you ended up staying there on scene? Do you remember? Uh, the whole evening until they finally released me. It was almost 10 o'clock when I left because it was almost midnight when I got back home to my wife. Okay. Um, and you never, in the whole time that you were there, did you ever see any firearm or weapon? No. Okay. Um, may I have a moment, Judge? You may. Mr. McCullough, other than February 29th of 2020, had you ever met Mr. Cummings before? No. Okay. Your Honor, I'll pass the witness. Pass. No questions. Okay, Mr. McCullough, they're not going to ask you any more questions. You're free to go, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Can I have uh, Sergeant Griffin come back? Yes, sir. Okay, Sergeant Griffin, take the seat and remind, uh, let me remind you, still under oath, okay? You're going to have a seat. Thank you, Your Honor. Sergeant Griffin, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm going to just go ahead and jump in right where we had left off earlier this morning, okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm going to hand you... The item I handed you that's been marked as States Exhibit 29, um, does it have an identification label on it? Uh, yes, ma'am. Give me one second. Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay. And is the label associated with this case? Yes, ma'am, it is. Is the item sealed? Yes, ma'am, it's still sealed. Do you recognize that item? Um, and if you can go ahead and pick a corner and open it up, sir, and then tell us what it is.
You can just go ahead and take a peek in the box and then tell us if that's something you recognize. Yes, ma'am. This is the AR style rifle that was pictured in the pictures earlier and the one that was on. Okay. And I is have that to verify by looking at serial number, but is that the item you signed for from the state police yes, evidence yes. people? Your Honor, the state moves to admit exhibit 29. 29 will be admitted. And permission to publish? You may. Um, uh, Sergeant Griffin, if you could please go ahead and open the box and show the item of evidence to the jury. It's going to take a little more cutting here. Yes, sir. Is there anything else in that box, sir? I know, ma'am, there is not. If I have to submit this at home, then. Okay. And if you can go ahead and place the item back in the box and then put it here on Ms. Lynch's desk. Is there um, writing on that paper? Yes, ma'am. Uh, WC 431. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may. What is that item? It is an American Eagle green tip 5.56 45 millimeter FMJ. It's bullet. Okay. Is there also a mag? Well, uh, we'll have you open that up. Magazine, and it says 15 rounds. Okay. And is this label associated with this case? Yes, ma'am. It is. Um, is the item sealed? Yes, ma'am. It is. Can you please go ahead and open this and confirm what is inside that plastic envelope?
Oh no. And while you're putting on the glove, on that plastic envelope, is that an item that you also collected from the state police? Yes, ma'am. This is a the AR one. This was done has DPS initials and their information on it. Okay. So, what is inside that envelope? Uh, there is spent casing with the projectiles. Is there a magazine in there as well? Yes, there's an AR magazine. And MFT and Mod 2. Is that the same magazine that was collected from scene, the scene? I believe so, ma'am. It's in the packaging. Okay. Your Honor, the state moves to admit Exhibit 30. Your objection. I'm just unclear exactly what we're moving in. What I saw was just like a magazine and it sounds like there's more. Uh, you want me to? Yes, sir. Please go ahead and it's talk about the each brass, item. The expended brass from the rifle. So when you fire the ammo, it, that's the brass that comes out. There's actually the projectiles that were removed from, I guess, the wall and, and other stuff. And then there's the unspent rounds that were in the magazine. How many unspent rounds are there? Seven. Is Seven unspent rounds. And then is the magazine empty? Yes, ma'am. I think for purposes of the record, each of these separate items, the magazine should be one exhibit. These projectiles that were extracted from a wall should be a different exhibit. Okay. I can label Have them you, separately. That would be a good, good idea or, or do a, a sub uh, number such as 30A, B, C, and D just to keep uh, the record clean. Yes, sir. So how many items are there, sir? Uh, there's the magazine, the projectiles, the spent brass, and then the ammunition. The four total. Why don't you go from 30A through 30D? Yes, Thirty A through thirty D will be admitted. I'm sorry, which one is thirty A? Magazine is thirty A. What's thirty B? Thirty B is the spent casings. Thirty C is the projectiles. Thirty D is the unspent ammo. permission to approach. Mm -hmm. I'm you with the mark for Does that have an identification label on it? Yes, ma'am, it does. Do you recognize that envelope? Yes, ma'am. Is this the um, an item of evidence that you Signed for from the New Mexico State Police. Yes, ma'am, it is. And is this label associated with this case? Yes, ma'am, it is. Um, and is the item sealed? 
Yes, ma'am, it is. Can you please cut it open and tell us what's inside? canister of mace with the brand being mace okay. and is this an item that is associated with this case yes ma'am it is your honor the state moves admission of exhibit 31 into evidence no 31 will be admitted and if you could please hold that up for the jury sir thank you sir And for purposes of the a clear record, I would um, <clears throat> ask to mark the tape that was in the box as a separate exhibit. Okay, thirty-two. I'm going to mark the electrical tape. Exhibit thirty-two. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That'll be admitted. Does it have an identification label? Yes, ma'am, it does. And is that identification label associated with this case? Yes, ma'am. And is this one of the pieces of evidence you signed forth from the New Mexico State Police? Yes, ma'am, it is. Can you please open the envelope and tell us what's inside? Um, Your Honor, the state moves admission of Exhibit 33. It'll be admitted. And, sir, could you please hold that item up for the jury? Is that 33 or 32? 33. 32 is the tape. Oh. Thank you, sir. Um, Honor, may I approach? You may. I'm handing you with the mark for identification Does that item of evidence have an identification label? Yes, ma'am, it does. And is this label associated with this case? Uh, yes, ma'am, it is. And is this one of the items you signed for from the New Mexico State Police? No, ma'am, it is not. Okay, tell us about this. This one's the shirt, uh, extra large green shirt, from me, and it has mine, so it's sealed by me. Okay. Is this the shirt that you collected from the back of Mr. Cummings' truck? Yes, ma'am, this would be. Can you please go ahead and cut open that item and <coughs> tell us what's inside there?
green shirt. And is that the shirt you collected from the scene on February 29th? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, the state moves admission of Exhibit 34. Okay. You'll be admitted. Deputy Griffin, could you please open up that shirt and show it to the jury? Okay, thank you, sir. Does that item of evidence have an identification label? Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay. I'll give you a minute to put a glove on. Excuse me. Does that identification label to you appear to be associated with this case? Yes, ma'am. Does that have your initials on it? Yes, ma'am, it does. Um, do you recognize this piece of evidence? Yes, ma'am. Is this something you collected from the scene on February 29th? Yes, ma'am, this is. And can you go ahead and cut it open and tell us what's inside? What is that, sir? It would be the jacket and the liner. And what is that? This is the liner that was in the back of the pickup truck as well as the jacket. And these were um, the items you collected from the back of the sister Cummings truck? Yes, ma'am, they are. Okay. Your Honor, the state moves admission of Exhibit 35. Any objection, Counsel? No objection. They'll be admitted. Okay, sir. Um, that's all I'm going to have you touch for right now. So earlier this morning, you testified that you were on the on-scene sergeant for the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. How long were you on scene from start to finish? From start to finish, I got there at, I want to say, 730s when I met Mr. McCullough, so probably eight-ish. 
and then I got off the scene, I believe, approximately 2 o'clock the next day. Okay. So that would have been March 1st? Yes, ma'am. And when you were, in, you were in there at the ranch during the daylight hours then? Yes, ma'am. Um, and this is a remote area, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. When you were out there, is it possible to see someone driving towards the ranch from a distance? From a distance, mm, not that far, just because of the way the mountains are. You wouldn't be able to see them. You'd hear them long before you saw them. Okay. Um. Your Honor, um, permission to publish what's already been admitted as stakes exhibits 1 through 12? It'll be admitted. And I'll, I'll let you publish them. Here you go. Before we go on into your next role in this investigation, what you did, we're going to go ahead and go through some of the photos that have already been admitted. This is State's Exhibit 3. Do you recognize this area? Yes, ma'am. Can you describe to the jury what this picture represents? Uh, this is actually the probably most of the 16 acres of the property. Exhibit four. Where would the entry of the ranch be? Uh, if you look at the bottom right corner, there's the white, there's a vehicle further off the side. That's, I think that's actually mine. You can uh, um, touch the screen. Okay. This is your entrance right where the truck's sitting. Okay. There are two, uh, two <coughs> gates. There's a gate here. Can you show a, us on the screen where the, the gate, gate is? Where, he, where this car is at, and then there's a second gate right here. The, the road that goes this way is for ranchers to go through the property, and then the other one is to the main property. Okay. This is State's Exhibit 5. Where was the um, mobile home at? mobile homes right here okay. and then states exhibit six I'm just gonna go ahead and go through these states exhibit seven now this is or at least from these pictures it appears to be pretty <coughs> flat as far as terrain yes, would you agree Yes, ma'am, right in this area is definitely. Okay. So where would, let's start, put this picture up. This is State's Exhibit 8. Do you know where Cabazon, the Cabazon Peak area would be based on this photograph? In this direction. Because that's okay. the way in. And then this is State's Exhibit 9. From this photograph, where was the mobile home? Mobile home is right here. And that's where the um, Mr. Audiola's body was found? That is correct. Where was Mr. Cummings' trailer? Mr. Cummings' trailer is right here. And if you know, where was the water spigot? I don't know the location of that. I would assume on the outside of the house, but I can't. Okay. I'm going to put under the document camera states exhibit 10. We're having a technical issue here, I think. <laughs> Got to warm up. There we go. Mm -hmm. And where is the mobile home in this picture? The mobile home itself. Apparently, it doesn't <laughs> like me. Go 
got to warm up, maybe. Let me turn it off and on. And where was the entrance where Mr. Cummings' vehicle was? This direction. I'm putting under the document camera safe exhibit 11. What is this a photograph of? That's a picture of Mr. Ariano's vehicle. It's a black F-250. And safe exhibit 12. Same vehicle. Okay. And is that the entrance to the mobile home? That is correct. That is the one of the entrances. There is two. Where is the other entrance? The other one's in the kitchen living room area. It's like a studio apartment on the other side. Okay. Um, what did you do next in this investigation? After you signed for the evidence from the New Mexico State Police that we already went through, what was your next role in this investigation? After that, I logged all the evidence, went home. Uh, Monday morning, I went to OMI for the autopsy. Where are autopsies done at? At the OMI or SLD labs off of uh, Lomas area. In Albuquerque? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember what date the OMI was or it the was on, um, autopsy was? I want to say it's the third Monday, the third of March. And Second who, or third. The autopsy you attended, who was the decedent? Uh, Mr. Arano. And after the New Mexico State Police had processed the scene, did you ever go into the manufactured home? Uh, that day, no, I did not. I, I, they walked me through their exit normally during uh, their processing. They'll do an exit where they walk you through what they found, and they walk you through all the evidence at the same time. Okay. And did they do that outside the manufactured home? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and did that conclude your involvement in this investigation? Yes, ma'am, that is. Okay. May I have a moment, Judge? Okay. And sir, um, one final question. Where this manufactured home, is this in Sandoval County, State of New Mexico? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll pass the witness. Okay, hold on. We're gonna take a, a, our, our afternoon break, 15 minute break, and this time, what I want you to do is follow my bailiff and go into the first courtroom for your break. Right. So let's be in recess for 15 minutes.
said not to get you a Christmas gift because it takes way too long for you to open a present. It's, it's being live streamed on YouTube and people are putting comments. And that's all the comments have been really soft. Cassidy's watching the comments coming out of YouTube and they're like, don't give him a Christmas present. Hey, Georgia. Good, how are you? Are you okay? I, I thought, thought the chair came out from under you. Before we started, I almost got up to rush. I don't know. Somebody from my office goes, don't say anything stupid. It's green.
can we be, before we before we get started? Uh, th this this trial is being live streamed, and I've been informed from people out of the county actually that a number of folks are not in here wearing masks, especially when you take a break. Anytime you're in the courtroom, you have to wear a mask. Otherwise, we will get in trouble with the Supreme Court. So keep your mask on at all times while in the courtroom. All right. And yeah, they're bringing in the jury now. Maybe seated. Okay, defense, you may cross examine this witness. Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon. Let me get settled here a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> so now uh, you testified on February 29th, 2020, um, that Lieutenant Tomlinson contacted you and asked you to go out to the scene. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. And you had to meet a deputy kind of away from the property to <laughs> escort you to the property. Yes, ma'am. And that's because this is so far out there, you couldn't have really found it without someone who knew the way to show you. Correct. Okay, and by the time you arrived, do you know what time you arrived on scene? Uh, like, like I said, about an 8, 7.30 is when I got the general area. I believe that's Cabazon Peak. And then from there, they drove me from that to the house. Okay, around 7.30 p.m. Yes, ma'am, that's okay. why I said approximately 8 o'clock is my guess. Okay, um, so around 8 p.m. you actually get over to the ranch area. Yes, ma'am. All right, and is that when you first made contact with Mr. Cummings, or what time did you first make contact with him? I didn't make contact with him for a little bit after. I was talking to the deputies that were on scene first. They're kind of giving me the rundown of what they had, where they had it, who, what, when, where, why, and whatnot, and told me that EMS was already on the way and why. Okay, so 8 p.m. or so, you actually arrive at the ranch, you talk with the deputies, uh, do you have any idea of how long it took for the EMS to arrive? Uh, no, ma'am, I don't. Okay. Would it be in the CADS? It should be when they dispatched it. Okay. If I were to approach you with the CADS, do you think you could help me find that? I could try. May I approach you the witness? May. See where they said had them staged somewhere, which means have them wait somewhere. But I don't see where it says arrived. What time did they say to stage the EMS? The EMS have EMS stage at Cabazon and Pipeline. That's 1746. Okay. But then, uh, and that just reiterates it at 1752. 
N52 will stage at Cabo Zone and Pipeline. Okay, can we tell when EMS arrived or? I don't see it. Okay. Just give me through. I don't see it, man. No? Okay. May I approach to retrieve it? Actually, it says, uh, I did find something here. It says, uh, start EMS to meet Tom 212 and the detective at 2028, but I don't know where that's referring to. So 2028 is 28. Yeah, but I'm assuming that's something different. That's all I see. Just prove it through. Thank you, sir. So where it says start EMS to meet T two twelve, who's T two twelve? I don't know who Tom 212 is. Okay. I assume that's uh, uh, Deputy Gutierrez. Okay. I'm guessing, because if it's saying her and de uh, detective. So it's, according to the CADS here, at 2028, suspect is complaining of heart problems, possibly being contaminated with some type of gas on his face. And okay. then it says start EMS. Okay. So that's at 2028, so that's 8.28 p.m.? Okay. Yeah. So does it seem likely that EMS arrived after that? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So after 828, so if they're getting dispatched at 828, how long does it, do you think it takes for them to arrive? I couldn't tell you that answer. Depends on where they're at, what they're doing, call volume. Okay. Do you think maybe after 9 p.m.? Possibly. I'm okay. not going to guess. Okay. And it was after EMS saw Mr. Cummings that you and Deputy Gutierrez took the photos of him that we've seen. Correct. We waited till after he was seen. Okay. Did you make contact with him before EMS saw him? No, ma'am, I did not. Okay. So you waited till after EMS checked him out. That is correct. Okay. Uh, what time do you think you actually first spoke with him? I couldn't even give you a guess, to be honest with you, because if I can't tell you what time they got there, I can tell you. Okay. So maybe no earlier than 930? Sounds good. Okay. Do you know what time the altercation between Mr. Cummings and Mr. Ariola occurred at? No, I don't know the exact time that it started. Okay. So you're the one who went over and retrieved the clothing from the back of Mr. Cummings' truck? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. All right, and I think you said that it was wet to the touch? Yes, ma'am. Okay, was it damp or wet? What? Wet and damp is still the same. It still has liquid on it, so mm -hmm. either or it had to be put in a, uh, had to be put in paper. Okay. Because so, if not, then you get mold or whatever on plastic. Okay, do you know how long the clothing had been sitting in the back of that pickup truck? No, ma'am. All right, and then you saw the firearm that was leaning against the porch? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Okay, and the magazine had already been removed from the firearm? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you inspect the firearm? No, ma'am, I did not. All right. Now, you're the one who tagged the firearm into evidence, though, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and so this is the, this is the firearm that you tagged in? Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, now, it's already been published to the jury, but with the court's permission, Your Honor, I would actually like for the detective to um, take the rifle and give the jury a closer look at it. That would be fine. Make sure that that rifle is safe, okay? Yes, sir. That's it's fine. cleared. It has the, I left the 
piece in the middle to forgive. Okay. Now, sir, if you can you take it back actually? Now, detective, taking a close look at that firearm, would you agree with me that there is some sort of dried substance or dried spatter on the firearm? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And is it on both sides? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Detective, may I have yeah. your assistance over here, too? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, if you could, just, I think there's, I don't know if it really shows up very well on here. Would you agree that there is some kind of dried liquid basically all over the firearm? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, I do actually have a couple more questions if you want to just take it over to the stand. <clears throat> what is the tip of the firearm called? Well, that's a flash suppressor area. Flash suppressor area? Yes, okay. And could you just hold it up for us? And can you just describe what it looks like at the tip? Circular has exit points for the gases. Okay. How many exit points does it have? This one has five. Five. Are, do they go all the way around the circumference of it? No, or? they do not. Only the top. Only the top. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think I'm done with it. <laughs> I appreciate it.
Yes, ma'am. You said that this was the can of mace that was tagged into evidence? Yes, ma'am. You did not actually retrieve this from the home, is that correct? No, ma'am, I did not. State police did. Okay. Did you inspect the can? No, ma'am, I did not. You did not. Okay. It was in a sealed bag when I received it. Okay. But this is the canister that the state police passed off to you to tag into evidence? Yes, ma'am. And does it look like there's something, some kind of residue on the inside of this? Talking about on the, the ejection port where it's yes. coming out? Yes, ma'am. Now, the rifle had a cap on the scope, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And I believe that was also tagged in? Uh, yes, ma'am, there was one that was with the rifle and the other one was found underneath it. Right, so there was a cap on either end of the scope? Yes, ma'am. Okay, the parts that was broken off, where was that located? Which one? The one that's inside the, the box is still in there. This one that was tagged separately. Where it was located, I could not tell you. State police would have to answer that. Yes, ma'am. Do you know where the electrical tape came from? Based on pictures, it was what was holding that cap on, is my guess. Okay. Um, at the time, though, that this was recovered, was the cap still on the rifle or was it off? I cannot answer that. I didn't do that. You that would be. State yes, ma'am. I did not process any of that. Okay. Did the electrical tape come like this when you received it? It was already that way, correct. approach? You may. Mm -hmm. I have a bag. I haven't marked it yet. Um, can you look at that bag and tell me what it is? It says it's black sunglasses. And do you know where that came from? Uh, says it was located halfway by entrance, hallway by entrance. Is this something you tagged into evidence? I tagged it in, state police recovered it and sealed it. Okay, so the state police recovered it as part of their search. They handed it off to you, you tagged it in. That is correct. Okay, and that would be the same process you used for all of this other Most evidence. of it, yes ma'am. Okay, oh that's true, there were a couple of things that you actually tagged. Yes ma'am. That you had located. Okay, so that pair of sunglasses were uh, handed off to you by state police to tag in. Yes ma'am. Okay, and do we have the scissors? I have scissors still. You up have here. scissors? Yes, Could you open that? Okay. Now those sunglasses, are those the sunglasses that the state police handed to you? Yes, ma'am. They were in the sealed package. Okay. And those were tagged into evidence in relation to this case? Yes, ma'am. Uh, at this point in time, the defense would move for the admission of those sunglasses as, I guess, Defendant's Exhibit A. They'll be admitted okay. as, as Defendant's A. Yeah. Where are we putting
approach with a exhibit sticker. No, you didn't actually recover those sunglasses, though. No, ma'am, I did not. Did you ever actually enter the trailer? Only for the exit walkthrough. Okay, and what is an exit walk? Walk. That's where they walk me through everything that they found on scene, and what they had, such as they pointed out bullet holes, location of Mr. Ariano, where they found it, and then they walk me through all the evidence that they had. Okay, and did you take any photos? Uh, no, I did okay. not. Okay, I think it was Deputy Gutierrez who was. That is correct. Okay. And were you wearing any recording devices that night? No, ma'am. That's a no? That is correct. No, ma'am. Okay. And you said you went to OMI to attend the autopsy of Mr. Ariola? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, did you take anything into evidence from OMI? No, ma'am. They send that to us. I just review my notes. And I apologize if I asked you this already. Did you inspect the firearm? No, ma'am. I did not test the firearm in any way, shape, or form. No? Okay. All right, thank you. I have no further questions. State any redirect. I just have a couple of questions for you, Detective. Um, on cross-examination, you were asked some questions, um, and you were asked to show the rifle to the jury. Yes, ma'am. Were you able to see some sort of markings or what appeared to be some sort of substance on the firearm? Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you know if that could have been gun cleaning oil? Could have been. Could it have been hairspray? Uh, yes, ma'am. Could have Could been it, anything. It's a white in color substance if you're not talking about what's around one of the bolts, which looks like possible gun oil. Okay. Could it have been any, was it ever tested? Uh, no, ma'am. I don't think it was. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may I approach? You may. No, ma'am, I don't have anything. Exhibit 31, which is the academy. Yes, ma'am. You can take that out of the envelope. And, sir, you testified on cross examination um, about the ejection port on that, I believe, is what how it was phrased. Yes, ma'am. Can you please describe to the jury what you observe on that? It looks like it's rusted and something's caked all over it, possibly dirt or debris of some type. Okay. Um, does it appear to have a die on it? I'd have to pull it up, Google it. It'll tell you if it has guy dye in, some type of dye in it. Are you familiar with mace products containing dye? Uh, a lot of civilian market ones do. And what color is on that port? Uh, like a reddish. I could say rust colored. Okay. Okay. And um, I don't think I have any further questions, Your Honor. You may step down. You may be subject to recall. Okay, so don't don't discuss your evidence with any or your testimony with anyone, right? Yes, Your Honor. All right. You may step down. Thank you.
Okay. You, you may call your next witness. Testimony about to give the truth and the penalty of law. I do. Let's take a seat and then when, when you speak in the mic, just speak loud. <laughs> good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Can you please state and spell your name for the court reporter? Uh, Officer Carlos J. Herrera, uh, New Mexico State Police. Carlos is spelled C A R L O S. Middle name initials J is in John, last name is spelled H E R R E R A. And you stated <coughs> that you work for the New Mexico State Police? That is correct. Are you a full time sworn, salaried, and commissioned peace officer, sir? Yes. How long have you been with the New Mexico State Police? Uh, right about 10 and a half years. <coughs> Did you work in any other law enforcement entity prior to your time with State Police? No. And um, what is your current assignment? Right now, I'm assigned to the Armory at the Law Enforcement Academy. Okay. Tell us what you do at the Law Enforcement Academy. Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm in charge. Of, I'm, I'm one of the two armors we have at State Police, so uh, <clears throat> we order weapons, fix weapons, um, order ammunition. Matter of fact, I'm in charge of the Taser program there as well. Uh, there's lots of little things we do, but our main job is uh, supplying the field with the weapons and ammunition and fixing them if they have problems. <clears throat> Okay. Um, do you assist with training cadets? Sometimes, yes. <clears throat> what was your assignment in 2020? In 2020, I was part of the New Mexico State Police full-time crime scene unit. Okay. What does the crime scene unit do? So the State Police crime scene unit, what we do is we um, investigate uh, and process scenes as far as for any violent crime uh, that were called out to assist for. So in this case, uh, we were called out to assist the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office. <clears throat> okay. Um, how long have you been doing that type of work? At that time, it was a little over two years on the crime scene unit. And do you have any specialized training to be a member of the crime scene unit? Well, dur uh, during the time of the crime scene, the first year you're on crime scene, thank you. It's, uh, it's a one-year FTO program. So for one year, you're with a training officer. So you'll get up to 450, 500 hours of training, whether that be uh, on the job training, uh, in-house training from New Mexico State Police or outside training, going to classes out of state or in state. So <clears throat> part of the field training is also some classroom component. Correct. Okay. Um, did you participate in training in regards to the collection of evidence? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, collect, uh, collecting evidence on scene is just part of the crime scene job. So um, anytime we, we go to a scene, if we're going to process or collect evidence, we photograph it, right? We package it and then seal it and uh, you know, then we enter it into our evidence database so we know exactly what it is and on top of having a photo of exactly what piece of evidence it is. Okay. And depending on the type of evidence, depends how you process or collect that Correct. Evidence. Every scene's much different than, so everything, it's dependent on the scene. And um, have you received any training in regards to trajectory? Yeah, at that point we had received uh, classes on tra trajectory, so on and so forth. Okay. What is trajectory and what's it used for? Well, trajectory in this case, well, not in this case, in other cases, or when we're trained, uh, it allows you to get a direction so, uh, of a projectile. So, for example, if a projectile is, fr is discharged from a weapon and it hits a wall, um, depending how it hits a wall or a vehicle, we're able to get some sort of trajectory and angle, and maybe we can get a, a distance or an angle or how it was fired from that weapon. <clears throat> Can you also get which is the entry and which is the exit? Yes. I, I'm going to 
subject just to foundation. I think that we need to hear a little bit more about uh, Officer Herrera's training with regard to trajectory. And that's what <coughs> I'm at. Go ahead and ask those questions. So tell us about the um, classes that you did in regards to trajectory. Uh, so the trajectory class, this one was an in-house class by state police officers who have been <clears throat> Uh, on the crime scene unit for a while. Um, most of them are uh, experts in this field and they teach us as far as, uh, you know, in class uh, trajectory. Um, we actually go out to a range, um, we'll shoot a car or a, or a door and they'll show us how to, you know, put a, a rod through it um, and get an angle. Um, I've also taken a class with Mike Hag. Um, he's uh, based out of Albuquerque. He owns. He has a company that uh, specializes in in trajectory. <clears throat> so taking his class um, in this class, you, they teach you everything from uh, you know <clears throat> using your f stop, which is basically utilizing your camera to get the best picture. Uh, is it, utilizing, utilizing it at nighttime, daytime. Uh, what are you taking a picture of? Um, this whole room, are you getting a close-up? Um, there's many, many variables to a camera. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's a lot to learn. But we learned it, I mean, you know, if we take a picture at nighttime, how do we get uh, you know, a picture, especially when there's no ambient light, to you know, make it look like it's daytime? And there's the stuff you can do with a camera to uh, help you with that. How many crime scenes have you worked that involved photography? <laughs> I think I worked 150 plus cases, I don't know, 140 of them. We're always taking photographs. Somebody's always taking photographs. What's the process for taking photographs of a scene? <clears throat> well, so the initial photography of a scene um, is getting your initial photos. So in this case, uh, Edgar Lemus was assigned to take photos. So he took uh, photos of the scene, which are overviews. Um, just to show the scene as is, as is, without any without anything being touched or photographed by me or anything. So we just just take overview photos of the entire scene before we actually move in and start processing the scene. <clears throat> so do you do overall photos, mid range, and then close ups? Correct. Okay. Um, have you undergone training in regards to blood pattern? Yes, there is BPA blood pattern analysis training as well. Tell us about that. Uh, the BPA training is another in-house uh, training that's done by uh, another agent who is also an expert in this and um, you know it's I believe a two-week training course and then there's more training on top of that and it it, it allows us to learn uh, what how to look for blood what blood tells you as far as uh, the scene um, you know was blunt force trauma where there's was there a uh, a high-powered weapon used, did the person fall? Um, the blood will tell you the story of what happened sometimes, depending on the case. Okay. And how many crime scenes have you worked that involved blood pattern? At least 50 to 75. I don't know off the top of my head. And have you received any <coughs> certifications related to your field? Uh, yeah, we get certificates that we've completed those fields um, you know, satisfactorily. I mean, uh, when we're before we're able to go on to crime scene and you know become a crime scene manager and have you successfully completed all at, of those certifications at that time I did yes okay. and have you attended any additional or national trainings related to criminalistics uh, I went to a crime scene course crime scene management course in Hobbs and then I took a Mike Haggs course uh, in California that was based off trajectory that was a trajectory course how many cr major crime scene investigations have you been the lead on? Uh, probably about five. And how many um, times have you had to testify in court for those major crime scene investigations? I think three. This is the third one. Okay. <clears throat> how many major crime scene investigations have you been secondary or assisted on? 30, 40, I mean, a bunch. Okay. <clears throat> um, before we get into this scene, can you just tell the jury what's the first step that the state police does when they arrive to a scene to process it? After you get a warrant, of course. So 
when the state police gets called to process the scene, um, <clears throat> the crime scene manager, uh, and every, every scene has a different crime scene manager. So in this case, I was a crime scene manager, so I, uh, I, I told, or I, I let Ed, Agent Lemus know at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, that he was gonna take all the photos. So what he, what he does is we, we don't enter the scene. We don't touch the scene at all. He'll go and take all his overview photos of the entire scene. We don't touch any evidence. We don't look for evidence at that time. This is just overview photos of the scene. And the reason we do that is just in case, you know, if a piece of evidence is accidentally kicked or moved or somehow, you know, gets run over by a car, when we go in, we look at the overviews before and we know it was right there. Right? We don't take any cars in, so that's why we parked outside of the gate and Agent Lemus took all his overview photos before we even start, we, before we entered the scene. Okay, well, let's talk <clears throat> about February 29th then. <clears throat> Tell us what happened. How did you get notified? Uh, usually this time, my, my, my supervisor at the time uh, called me and said that uh, there was a scene in San Luis, uh, New Mexico, and it would be a death investigation. Um, and it was off of US 550, and, but the problem was there was no address and there was no cell phone service. So trying to get there would be hard. So we had to wait for deputies. Uh, I think the intersection of uh, US 550 and State Road 79, 279. Okay. What time did you receive that call? Uh, probably like 8.30, and I probably arrived there by about 10. Were you at home when you received this call? Yes. <clears throat> what? What information did you have about the call? The only information I received at the time when I was going down there, so uh, I was given a contact for Lieutenant Frank Thomason at the time, who was uh, the point of contact for me. So I contacted him, and he advised me that uh, there was a death investigation at a property in a mobile home, and um, uh, that uh, he was told that the victim, there was a deceased male inside the house, and the person in this case uh, said that uh, he shot him in self-defense because he had been maced. So you have this information and then you, do you remember what time you met at that meetup spot? Uh, about 10. 10 p.m.? Yes. And from the meetup spot, what happened? So once I got to the meetup spot, uh, usually, you know, it takes a while to get a search warrant. So we just waited there until we got a search warrant because uh, we had service there. So I needed to get a copy emailed to me so I could print it out, <clears throat> and then we could review the warrant and then uh, print it out. So if we were, if I went to the scene before that, I wouldn't have had that. I, I had, there's no cell phone service, so I couldn't print it out. So we waited there till about, I believe it was 12.30 on the morning of March 1st. The warrant came in, and then um, we reviewed it. It was signed by the judge, and then this sudden wind, but it was just a cold, cold night. Okay. So who arrived with you? Uh, so at the meeting point of 550 and uh, U.S. State Road 279, or State Road 279, uh, it was Agent Edgar Lemus and Agent Michael Bogue met, with, met up with us there. And then we all proceeded down to the uh, scene together. <clears throat> what was Agent Bogue's role in this investigation? I believe I, I had uh, tasked her with scanning the scene with the Leica scanner. Um. So when you arrive on scene, can you tell us what your observations were? So when we arrived on scene, I know there was a, a white pickup truck, I believe a Ram um, pickup truck that was parked near the, like a gate. There wasn't really a, a, there wasn't a gate, but there was a fence post that kind of showed where the, the property line was. It was uh, parked there, it was off. Um, and from that point on, after Edgar Lemus took his initial photos, his initial photographs, overviews, uh, after he was complete, then we entered the scene. Okay. Can you tell us what happened when you entered the scene? So uh, after Edgar Lemus took his initial photos, uh, then we do what's called a walkthrough of the scene. So okay. we're going we're gonna to look through, through the entire scene, uh, in this case the property inside the mobile home, to see you know, uh, what happened or, or what evidence is inside. Okay. Um, and that was myself, Agent Bogue, and uh, I believe... Sergeant Griffin at the time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> tell us about the walkthrough. What do you see when you walk up to the property? 
So we walked up to the property, it was super dark. I don't remember if there was power to the mobile home, I don't remember, but it was really dark. Um, we, we have flashlights, so I remember walking up to the to the mobile home and um, Sergeant Griffin at the time was pointing out stuff to me that they had seen because they were the initial responders. And then, uh, so there was a, uh, a rifle, uh, AR-15 type rifle laying outside the porch. It was leaned up against the, uh, the stairway um, and the magazine had been removed from that weapon and it was put on one of the steps. <clears throat> and that was outside. Outside the residence? Correct. <clears throat> Um, what happened next? So then once we uh, did a walk through the outside, then we went inside. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, Sergeant Griffin had pointed out to me that there were some defects on the exterior of the porch. Um, so just just for like further, for, you know, for f future thought that there was defects outside. So. We saw those went inside. What's um, a defect? Explain to the jury what you mean what a defect is. A, a defect is, in this case, a there was a holes in the side of the porch. Um, it could have, like, that's what we like to call it, a defect. So in trajectory, you know, if, uh, if, if, a, if a projectile goes through a wall, we'll call that a defect, okay? Um, but in this case, I didn't know at the time, so uh, I just called it a defect. That's why. Okay. Um, so you went inside the residence. What did you observe? Uh, I observed uh, one of the residents. <clears throat> it was really cold in there, super dark. Uh, I don't, again, I don't remember if there was electricity. There's no heat inside. Um, remember, if you go left, there's through the main door. You go left, there's uh, the uh, the living room area. Uh, there were some beds, a fireplace, and then walked around there, and then we made our way back towards the front door into the room in the front of the mobile home. And uh, when I went into that, the room, uh, that's where I saw a, a deceased male laying face down on the floor. How many bedrooms did this residence have? Oh, I saw one. I don't remember any other bedrooms. So it's, been, it's been a while. Okay. And um, do you know how many exit doors there were on this residence? Uh, I believe there was one, at least two. Um. Let's back up a little bit. Are you familiar with mace? Yes. Have you been maced before? Yes. How many times? I've been maced once, but I've... So in the training academy, we go and watch recruits or any law enforcement that officer who's coming through the law enforcement academy, whether it be state police or any other departments, uh, they get maced outside. And um, so I've been maced once myself in the academy, but... I've actually gotten, you know, sprayed from the wind going the wrong way as I'm watching them. So it, that's but directly in the face just once. <laughs> okay. How does, how does mace work? So mace is what they call an inflammatory. Uh, what it does is, so I remember, I'll, 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 you go when, when it was time for me to get mace in recruit school. They tell you to close your eyes. They spray you with the mace. The first, the, you don't open your eyes right away. So you start breathing in, you start coughing. And then you start like, uh, like I remember, I, it, it was hard to breathe. And then they say, open your eyes. And once you open your eyes, it's like fire. I mean, I've seen people fight through it just fine. I've seen people drop to the ground and just start screaming because it's, it's horrible. Um, but the reason they do that at the law enforcement academy is to let you know, hey, this is what it feels like. So if you were to get maced, you know, this is how you would fight through it. But it's, uh, yeah, it's hard and it, it burns for a long time. Um, how many times would you estimate you've been present when mace was used? Mm, at least a half dozen at the academy. Okay, what about other times? Uh, I can't recall any other times. Can you describe the scent to the jury? Uh, it's, it's hard to describe. It's like... Like if you if you inhale pepper, right? You want to like me. If I inhale pepper, I'll I want to sneeze and cough. If you multiply that times a thousand, and you get it in your eyes, I mean, it's you'll immediately know. If you go in a house that's where there's pepper spray present, or you've been sprayed, or it's there, you're gonna you're gonna know the scent. And if it's still strong, you're gonna start coughing and you need to get out of there. How long does the odor last for? <sighs> it all it depends. It could be an hour. It could be two hours, I don't, it just depends. 
Does the smell get on clothing? Yes. And to back up to one, one time, I do recall that our SWAT team did have to use their OC gas canisters inside a small camper. Uh, it was a small little travel trailer. And uh, the suspect eventually came out, but I had to process it. I, I'm just going to object to relevance if we're not talking about mace. If an OC canister is something that, that's being used by the SWAT team, I don't think that's mace, and I don't think this is relevant. Let's keep it with uh, mace. Yes, sir. Um, I'll just move on. Let's okay. talk a little bit about um, this. So in your observations watching cadets be maced, what's their first reaction? They scream. And then what's their next reaction? Do they rub their eyes? Do they? Uh, well, in this case, they're uh, trying to get a suspect that's in a, in a suit under control. So, um, in your the, observations, yeah, the, 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 the initial the initial reaction is either to try to open your eyes and get it out, or or just fight your way through it. Okay. What is the effect of water with mace? So, we were told that. You do not want to wash your face. Hearsay. You don't want to wash your face. Hearsay. Let me rephrase Sustain. this. Um, in your training at the academy, um, how does water affect mace? It'll react. Objection hearsay. It, it'll reactivate it is what it'll do. I'm sorry? It'll reactivate it. How long do the effects of mace typically last? When I got maced, it was at least a day or two before I was normal again. What are the physical um, characteristics on somebody's person if they've been maced? Uh, redness in the face, um, and your eyes are, are, are swollen. And... Um, in the times that you were present when mace was sprayed or you observed it, is there typically an excess that will drip out of the can? Uh, sometimes yes, depending on what type of canister you're using. Okay. And I don't know if you're familiar with any <clears throat> store-bought cans of mace. Are you familiar with that? No, not to the best, no. Just, just the ones that are provided to the Law Enforcement Academy. Okay. Um, when you entered the residence, did you smell anything that smelled like mace? Uh, I did not. And were the doors open or closed when you arrived? When I arrived, I believe the door was open. Which door? The front door. And are you talking about the front porch or the door to the manufactured home? Uh, the door, to the best of my knowledge, again, it's been three years, I think the front door, not the door to the porch, but the door to the mobile home was open a little bit. Um, So you were telling us about Agent Lemus's overall photos, and those are the photos you said were taken prior to anyone touching the scene. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, what am I looking at? <clears throat> and give me a moment to number these, sir. Okay. When you entered the residence, I'll continue asking questions. Um, was there any heat? No, not that I remember. It was cold inside that house. Okay. What was the ventilation like? Uh, I didn't. I don't think there was any. Uh, Again, I don't even know if there was power to that residence, but... I, I'm going to object to foundation and relevance. Ventilation in the building, if this gentleman showed up five to six hours later, is completely irrelevant to <clears throat> anything that we're talking about with regard to MACE. Um, and whether or not the doors were open or not open, five to six hours later is completely irrelevant. And, Your Honor, and, and we also don't have a foundation laid for the ventilation in the in the in the trailer because 
he doesn't know. And Your Honor, he testified that he went into the trailer, so he would know. He, I'm, and it is relevant if Mr. Cummings is claiming that he was maced. He, he can testify as to how he found the, the mobile home and what the condition was with respect to ventilation when he, when he entered the house that mo or that mobile home. Yes, sir. What was the, how long did you spend on scene there? I don't actually remember the exact time. It could have been eight, ten hours. I don't remember the exact time. It was a while. I mean, so you were there a while. What was the ventilation like while you were there? Uh, I didn't notice any type of ventilation at all. When you were there, did you notice if any of the windows were open? I do not recall. I don't remember. <clears throat> Your Honor, may I approach? You may. An officer, in those exhibits that I handed you, do you recognize those? Y yes. What are those? Photos, these are photos taken uh, of the scene. Okay. And were you present when these photos were taken? Yes, I, I was, yes. And did you direct Agent Lemus what photos to take? Yeah, not as specifically what photos to take, but to take all scene photographs. Okay. Um, do those photos appear to be the ones taken by Agent Lemus on the date of this incident? Yes. Or on March 1st, I guess, when you arrived? Yes. Your Honor, the state moves admission of exhibits 36 to 56. No objection. Will be admitted. And permission to publish? Sir, could you please describe what this photograph is? Uh, that, that looks like a, uh, an overview photo of the actual uh, scene, the residence at the scene. Okay. And I'm putting under the document camera, station 37. What is this a photograph of? That's a, a, another angle of the, the, the residence uh, where the scene was located. And if you know, whose vehicle is that? Uh, it belonged to Mr. 
Are we, are we all well? What is this a photograph of, sir? It's another photo of the uh, Mr. Ariola's pickup truck parked next to the front porch of the residence. And what is the item on the front porch? Uh, to the left, leaning on the stairs, is a rifle, an AR-15. And is that where you located the rifle when you first arrived on scene? Yes. <clears throat> That is a picture of the outside porch um, screen door, and then the other door inside is the actual door to the uh, to the mobile home that's open. And is this the door that you entered through? Yes, those those, those are the doors that we entered through. Now I'm putting under the document camera <clears throat> exhibit 40. Can you describe this photograph? Uh, that's the door um, that leads into the, the residence, the mobile home. Uh, that's a picture from inside the porch. Uh, taking a photograph of the, the door that we entered through uh, in the mobile home. And then, again, the bathroom, the, the restrooms on the other side of that hallway. So when you enter into this door, where was the decedent found? So if you go through the front door or the main door here, and you take an immediate right, there's a room right there, and that's where the decedent was found. <clears throat> now I'm putting under the document camera face exhibit 41. <coughs> what is this a photograph of? So from the previous photo, like if you took a right, it took you to the room where the decedent was located, if you went left, then you went into the um, living room area, and that's a picture of the living room area. And I'm putting under the document camera face exhibit 42. What is this a photograph of? It's another photograph of the living room area showing the, uh, the other door open on the other side of the, the mobile home. So that's the other exit to this mobile home? Yes. That's the uh, kitchen area inside the mobile home. <clears throat> and I'm putting under the document comment space exhibit 44. That's a different view of the kitchen area showing the basically where the table's at, where the uh, stove's at in relation to the door the main door that we entered through. And have you processed scenes where there was an altercation or a fight before? Yes. How many times? Uh, I had the top of my head, maybe three or four. What are common things that you observe in a room when there's a fight? Stuff gets moved around, stuff gets broken. Did you observe any of that here? Uh, in this case, to the best of my knowledge, the only I didn't notice any, anything that was broken inside the, the residence or the room that I can recall. Yes, sir. So I'm putting under the document camera space exhibit 45. <clears throat> what is that a photograph of? That's a photograph of the room where the decedent was located. And is the decedent in this photograph? He is. Uh, his legs are at the bottom of the photo, he's wearing some brown uh, winter coveralls. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm putting under the document camera face exhibit 46. What is this a photograph of? Uh, that's the photograph of the same room where the decedent was located. Okay. And that's the decedent in the photo lying face down. And this is the room as you found it when you guys entered the scene? Correct. These are all the overview pictures taken by Agent Lemus. Okay. I'm putting under the document camera space exhibit 47. Is this, what is this, sir? 
Uh, it looks the same room uh, where the decedent is located. Looks like uh, you know, a sheet on a bed and then uh, the carpet underneath it looks like it's been folded up. And I'm putting under the document camera face exhibit 48. What is this photograph? It's the same room. Uh, that's, that's the bed that's on the other side of the wall. And uh, the white sheet jackets hung up in uh, that same plastic tote next to the bed. Right here? Yes. <clears throat> and I'm putting under the document camera face exhibit 49. Let me move the other one. Out of the way. What is this a photograph of? Uh, it's the picture of the same bed in the previous photo, just from a different angle. Shows like a little light at the top. And I'm putting under the document camera space exhibit 50. What is this a photograph of? Uh, those are the bunk beds located inside the room. Again, taken from a different angle inside the room. And the decedent is located at the bottom right. Yes, that's the same tote. <clears throat> and I'm putting under the document camera space exhibit 51. What uh, is this a photograph? Same room, just a different angle, um, showing uh, the decedent in relation to where the door to the room's at. Okay. And can you point to us where that tote was, the rubber tote? The rubber tote? Yes, sir. The the silver one? Yes, sir. You can point on the cam on the um right here? this, yeah. Let's touch right here. Okay. And where are the um clothing that was hanging on the wall in the other photograph? It was uh just right behind it on the wall. Can you point to it on the photograph for us? Uh probably if this is the wall, probably right here. And the clothing was still hanging there when you processed this thing? As is, yeah. That's how we got it when we got there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what is this a photograph of? Uh, that's a photograph of uh, the decedent uh, lying face down in that room. And where is that rubber toe in relation to the uh, It's right next to his head. Okay. And um, Uh, just <clears throat> pretty much the same photo, just a different angle, showing the decedent laying face down uh, next to the gray tote with his head pretty much almost leaning on the tote itself. And um, is there also a hat in this picture? There is. It's right, right above his head, a white hat, a white ball cap. Uh, that's the that's a picture of uh, the decedent's right hand. Uh, that's where we found uh, the, looked to be a black canister or a black bottle of uh, pepper spray or mace. That's the same photo, just in uh, another photo, but just uh, more of a close up. And that shows the uh, the can of mace in the decedent's hand. Can you describe the can of mace to us? Uh, it's just, you know, it looks like you're, I don't know exactly what brand it was, where it's purchased from, but uh, based off the way it is in the hand, it looks like the uh, the nozzle is facing backwards. So it's not facing the right direction. So the way it's in his hand, would it be facing Mr. Audiola? Yes. Can you also describe what's on the nozzle or sprayer? <clears throat> uh, it looks like dirt or buildup of some sort from, this looks like dirt buildup. I'm not too sure, but that's what, in my, that's what it looks like. Um, how long were you, did you spend the majority of your time in that bedroom? Yes. 
How long do you think you spent in that bedroom? A good five hours at least. Can you please describe to the jury the bedroom, the size dimensions, if you can? Uh, it was a small room for having, what, two bunk beds and then another bed on the corner, three beds in a small room. It was, it was a, very, a very small room. What would it be the size? Eight by eight, eight by ten, I, I'd be guessing, but it was a small room. How many people were able to fit in that room while you processed it? Um, well, in this case, uh, I let Agent Lemus do his stuff first, and then I would go in there and do my stuff because it's, it was, we were too close together trying to take our photographs, my photographs and his photographs at the same time because there was not nearly enough room to be around doing that. <clears throat> and then I'm going to put under the document camera Case Exhibit 56. <clears throat> Of. That's a photograph of the AR-15 uh, rifle that was located outside the residence on the porch area. Okay. What are those little um, green markers? So whenever we take photos of evidence, um, when we're entering it, we always take photos with a green marker. That allows us to know which piece of evidence is what, so, um, so we don't enter it incorrectly. So in this case, uh, when we go back to our photos, G1, meaning green one, would be the rifle. G2 or green, green two would mean the, um, the magazine itself. So it, that way, if we have to review our photos to remember which piece of evidence is what, we have a photograph of it. I'm going to put under the document camera, it's been admitted as State Exhibit 55. Um, what does the debris on the nozzle indicate to you? Objection, foundation. Sustained. <coughs>
Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Can you please look through those photos, sir? Yes. Did you review the exhibit states 57 through 77, sir? I did. <clears throat> and um, do you recognize them? Yes. What is it? Uh, those are photos uh, taken of the scene. How do you know? Uh, these are taken by uh, Agent Lemus. Okay. And do they appear to be a fair and accurate representation of the scene that day? Yes. Your Honor, the state moves admission of his state's exhibits 57 through 77. I have no objection. I, okay, they'll, yeah. they'll be admitted. Uh, real quick, though, Judge, can we approach again? <coughs> Let's go through these photos again. Okay. So um, tell us how you process a crime scene in which a firearm is used. So what we'll do is we'll um, photograph the firearm. Um, so if the firearm is left on scene, uh, we'll photograph it as is, where it's at, so on and so forth, take photos of it. And then after we got all our photos of it, we'll then uh, retrieve it. Uh-huh. Uh, we'll take it to usually our crime scene van and then we'll process it there under cause better lighting conditions, so on and so forth. Uh, we'll take a picture of the gun, you know, all four, depending on how many sides it is, four sides, we'll take a picture of the, um, the serial number, the make, the model, the caliber. Uh, we'll remove the magazine if there's a magazine inside. Uh, we'll photograph the magazine to see if there's uh, any uh, ammunition loaded inside the magazine and then what we'll do is we'll unload the weapon so we'll um, to see if there was one actually chambered inside the weapon itself so sometimes there is sometimes there's not <clears throat> so what are the pieces that you're looking for um, when there's an investigation involving a firearm what are the components uh, usually we're looking for uh, the gun itself right the the magazine the ammunition used any ca any sp any spent casings that may be on scene. Okay. Can you describe to the jury what a spent casing is? So whenever a uh, a weapon is fired, um, whether it be a handgun, an automatic weapon, not a revolver, but a, a handgun or uh, an AR-15 type rifle, whenever there's a uh, a round discharge from that rifle, it's going to extract the casing, and it's going to fly out either to the right or to the left, depending on what type of weapon you're using and it's gonna fall on the ground and that's what we call a spent casing, a fired casing. 
And um, what is a projectile? Uh, a projectile is the, the, so you got a bullet, right? And on the front of the, the bullet, it's the piece of copper, depending on what type of bullet it is. It could be, I mean, there's so many different types, but the projectile is the actual piece that's fired out of the, the rifle itself through the barrel, and that's what impacts doors or you know, so on and so forth. <clears throat> Your Honor, the state moves admission of exhibits 57 through 77. Yeah, they've been admitted, I think. Yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. Sorry. I'm getting sidetracked here. All righty. Um, I'm putting underneath the document camera state's exhibit 57. Can you describe what this photograph depicts, sir? Uh, Looks like there's a, uh, we like to use the disposable um, rulers, I guess, uh, on the decedent's clothing, and it looks like there's a defect um, on the side of the clothing itself, some sort of defect from something. Okay. I'm putting underneath the document camera state's exhibit 58. What is that a photograph of? That's uh, for, uh, a close-up of the previous photo of the defect located on the clothing of the decedent. Okay. And tell us about the body. Who processes the body of Mr. Adiola? So whenever we go to a scene where they're involving any type of death, um, we never touch the body. Uh, we don't take anything off the body. We don't move it. We don't roll it over. Uh, OMI has strict authority over that body. So whoever the, the person in charge of OMI comes that day, uh, after we're done processing the scene and it's okay for them to come and, you know, take their photographs, look what they need to look for, then OMI will go ahead and move the body uh, and look for anything, you know, they, they can find prior to being shipped off to Albuquerque um, to be, you know, to have a, an autopsy. <clears throat> okay. And was that done here? Yes. So you guys take the overall photographs and then OMI takes their portion and then you continue to process the scene. Is that how it works? Correct. And we'll take photographs with OMI, but again, we don't, we don't manipulate the body at all until OMI gets there. Okay. I'm putting underneath the document camera state's exhibit 59. What is this a photograph of? Uh, that's a photograph of, uh, <clears throat> the scene after the decedent was transported out of the the trailer. Um, that's what underneath there you see the uh, spent shell, uh, the fired casings and the blood underneath the uh, decedent along with his hat. Can you please um, circle for the jury where the spent casings were? Uh, there's That I can see, yes, that I can see, yes. And in, in this photograph, in relation to the bedroom, where was the um, plastic bin at? Uh, the plastic bin, after we, again, after we processed the photos, the, the gray plastic bin everybody saw was located right here. <clears throat> photograph of? Uh, another fired casing found on scene. Okay. Was this the only fired casing on that side of the room? That I remember, yes, that I, that I recall. Um, how many casings were in the bed, spent casings were there in the bedroom? I believe there was 10 or 11. I don't remember the exact number, but it was right around 10 or 11. Okay. Looking at your report, refresh your memory. Uh, actually, the evidence list, if you have it, would actually help me. Yes, sir. Your Honor, may I? May I? Ms. Walker, can I see what you're going to show him? Sure. Just because I I think there's a couple of different things.
<clears throat> Sir, what would refresh your memory? Um, so whenever we enter evidence, um, we'll enter it as a fired casing. So that way, if I have the, the evidence list, the evidence list, wherever it says a fired casing, I'll just count all those and that'll tell me how many we retrieved from the scene. Okay. Your Honor, may I <clears throat> So, uh, per the evidence list, there is 11 casings recovered, fired casings recovered. Okay. <clears throat> and were all of those, where were all of those casings located or recovered from? The, uh, to the best of my knowledge, or all, or my recollection, it's been three years, was inside the room where the decedent was uh, located. Were there casings in any other part of the room? Not that I can recall, no. Describe for us what is in this photograph. Um, that's a different angle of another photo. So where the circle's at, that's where the casing was found there. And then uh, number 15 was on the bed. That's the, um, the canister, the bottle of mace that was in the dece decedent's hand. Who took it out of his hand? Uh, well, we'll ask OMI if they want to take it with them or if they want us to keep it. And they allowed us to keep it. So... Uh, I don't remember if it was one of us who took it out of the hand or uh, OMI, but we do get permission, and then we'll photograph it and package it as evidence. <clears throat> and what is this photograph of? Um, more evidence located on scene. Looks like um, I can see about four more casings. I'm going to circle them. Yes, sir. There's also a, um, a piece of the scope there. And what is that identified as in uh, the picture? 14, number 14. What is number four? Uh, number four, oh, that looks like another casing. I'm sorry, it's hard to see on the screen. It's another fired casing. Uh, just a different angle of the previous photos uh, showing the relation of evidence. Looks like you can see three, it looks like three or maybe four more fired casings. So one right there, or six, seven. That's all I can see in the photo. <clears throat> Angle. Yep, just another photo, a different angle of uh, evidence that was recovered. So um, another fire casing there, one there, there, two right there. Um, <coughs> that's it for fire casings that I can see. Is this the side of the room that the majority of the fired casings were located? Yes. I'm putting underneath the document camera space exhibit 65. <clears throat> and um, what is this a photograph of? Uh, just another angle of uh, where uh, evidence was located. So number eight was a fired casing, <coughs> uh, 10, 
11. Uh, that's all I can see in this photo from now. What is this a photograph of? Uh, looks like the, a gray tote with a uh, fire casing on top of it. Look at it, number 12. Okay. <clears throat> I have a moment to explain. Okay. Putting underneath the document camera states exhibit 68. What is this a photograph of? Um, just a different angle of um, evidence collection where they were located in reference to the room. Okay, and what is exhibit 18? Uh, 18 looks like a, I believe it was a rifle. It's a close-up view or a, like a mid-range view of the same photo uh, documenting the rifle that was located underneath the, the bed, well, between the bed mattress. <clears throat> was that also collected? Yes. I'm putting underneath the document camera states exhibit 70. What is this, a photo? It's a photograph of the black mace okay. bottle that was located in the student's hand. And that was collected too. What is this a photograph of, sir? That is a photograph of uh, the front door uh, where, where I went in through, looking back at the porch. Okay. And states exhibit <clears throat> 73. That's a view from inside the porch area looking back at you know the 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 property and i'm putting underneath the document camera states 76 what is this a photograph of uh, that's the picture of the rifle that was collected on scene the AR ar15 rifle what other items um were collected from the scene um to the best of my knowledge, we had the fired casings, uh, the rifle itself, the magazine, uh, I believe the, the hat, um, a piece, I believe a piece of the scope that was, that fell off or was on the floor. Um, some swabs, DNA swabs, or, we, or swabs of blood. Okay, tell us how you do that. <clears throat> tell us about DNA swabs with blood. So they're not really, so when we process the scene, especially with blood, um, we're going to process it no matter what. Um, and in this case, I process the, uh, the suspected blood stain. So uh, I label them SBS, which is, means suspected blood stain. Okay. Um, as obvious as people might think it is, it's really not, you know, we, we can't say specifically that it's blood. Only the lab, when we send it to the lab, can tell you, you know, if, if it's blood or whose blood it is, is it human blood? So um, I'll just pick certain areas to d get blood swabs. Um, we'll swab them two, two per, um, I guess, item number. Um, we'll let them dry on a drying table for about 10, 20 minutes, and then we'll package them as evidence, seal them up, and uh, send them off. And did you do that here? Yes. Do, are you the one who swabs the firearm? No, we do not process firearms. Only the lab is allowed to process the firearm for any type of DNA or whatever you want to talk about. So when you collected this firearm on scene, tell us the process for that. So with any scene in crime scene, right, you're, you're, you're processing a firearm and you're always wearing gloves, okay? Rubber gloves, uh, we change them out. We go through about a box of scene, maybe two boxes because we change them out so often. But um, anytime you're dealing with evidence or anytime you're inside the scene, you're always wearing protective rubber gloves. So if you're processing a weapon, especially uh, in this case, this AR-15, 
you're wearing gloves, um, and yeah, that's how, that's how we process weapons. Okay, and then you package it up, it looks like in a cardboard box? Correct, yes, correct. Um, we don't remove anything, so like that one had a scope, sometimes it's hard to um, package a, a rifle with a scope on it, so we just, you know, we have stuff that we do, um, but everything is packaged independently, you know, per whatever type of paper, plastic, whatever it depends. And do you seal that package? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. And then what do you do with that? Uh, once the package is sealed and it's dated and signed and initialed, um, then we'll, we'll uh, type it into evidence, our evidence tracker database. It'll print us out a, uh, a little, little label. We'll stick it on there, and then once evidence is all collected, um, whatever agency we're assisting, uh, they'll get an evidence list from me or whoever is the crime scene manager. Uh, we'll go through every single piece of evidence with that department, and they'll sign for it. They'll take it, and now that evidence belongs to them. So you don't, you're not the entity that takes it to the lab. The agency does. No, yeah, we don't. We don't ever keep evidence. Just we always. Uh, it's always signed off to whoever we're, we're assisting. So where would the <coughs> scope go on this particular rifle? Where would it go? Yes. I would go to probably the firearms lab in Santa Fe, okay. if they want. If it's depending on if it needs to be sent. So in this case, the um, broken scope that was on scene. Can you circle on the screen where that would be attached? Uh, at the front part. The cap. The cap. cap yeah. The Sorry. cap. The cap. The cap to the scope would go right there. Okay. To the front part of it. And um, you <clears throat> testified earlier that you work at the armory. Right? Correct. Do you ever use electrical tape to attach a cap? No, everything we use is it has caps that, that you know that fit and they sn they snug and they and they snap on. They're pretty snug. Okay. Um, I'm putting underneath the document camera. See, Exhibit Seventy Seven. What is this a photograph? Uh, that's a photograph of the magazine uh, that was collected, on, uh, that was laying next to the AR-15. How many rounds does this magazine hold? Mm, 30. And how many rounds were left in the magazine? Uh, I don't know the exact, I, I looked at, because we can look through the top of it, maybe six or seven, I don't know the exact number. Okay. Who, and who collected the magazine? Uh, Agent Nemus. Um, can you describe to the jury what type of ammunition was in this weapon? So this is uh, your standard 5.56 five, uh, ammunition, uh, just the size-wise. This was green-tipped ammunition. Uh, usually green tip is indi indicates uh, armor piercing rounds uh, that were located inside the magazine itself. <clears throat> before I go into another round of photos. Do you want me to continue? Hold your bench for a second. 